I mostly work on the editor, the extension host, and core remoting functionality. I'm a PM on the VS Code team working on remote development. I do demos. That's all I do. And PowerPoint slides. Yeah. Right now, I mostly work on debugging, profiling, and testing. I mostly work on the terminal and setting sync. I'm working on the language server protocol and the language server index format. I'm a software engineer working on VS Code, most recently on the terminal. I work on VS Code's JavaScript and TypeScript support, along with API features such as the WebView. I'm a software engineer working on VS Code's generic debugger and the debug adapter protocol. I'm a developer on the remote containers extension. Git integration, timeline view, and with our extension author community. I mainly work on search and our GitHub automation. I'm a designer on the VS Code team. I work on all the UI, UX, and iconography. I'm a software engineer working on notebook and editor support in VS Code. I work on authentication, issue reporting, and the GitHub pull requests and issues extension. And I'm a software engineer working on the Emmet extension for VS Code. I mainly work on the remote SSH extension, settings editor, search, and notebooks. I work on making the editor more useful for students, educators, and folks new to coding. I work on setting sync, configuration and extension management, and other Bugbench features. Welcome to VS Code Day. 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 And welcome to VS Code Day. Hello and welcome to VS Code Day. We're so happy to have you here wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Brian Clark. I'm your host for the show today, this event, and I'm really excited for what we have in store for you all. A couple of housekeeping things as we get started before we jump into things today is we want to take a look at the Code of Conduct and remind you all, basically just be kind, be friendly, behave yourselves, and uh, make sure we hold up to this. In addition to that, go to the next slide. In addition to that, let's take a look at our agenda for today. First up, we're going to have our keynote, um, which is going to be about VS Code and overnight success, although it was 10 years in the making with Eric Gamma. Then we have remote development with Visual Studio Code with Bridget Murtaugh, Dev Containers, a clean development environment with Johan L Larsorsa. Sorry, excuse me. Bringing Edge's dev tools to VS Code for debugging web apps with Chris Hellman. Supercharger Docker development with VS Code with Peter McGee. Notebooks in VS Code are getting revamped with Claudia Reggio, and VS Code tips and tricks with Sana Ajani. So that's our agenda for today. A couple other things to let you know that's going to be happening within the chat room and uh, some fun stuff that we have in store for you. Number one, there is some digital swag that's available. So if you go to the VS Code Day uh, website, the event page there, you'll see some wallpapers that we have available for you that are pretty cool. There's also a t-shirt that's available that you can check out um, on the Microsoft Store. We will have Q&A sessions, so please come ready with some questions. After you see each session, we're going to have some time for Q&A. We'll be fielding your questions from the community so that we'll be able to you know, get your thoughts and you have direct access to the folks that are helping build your favorite tool, Visual Studio Code. Um, we'll have some videos in between and things like that that will be fun. And also throughout the event, we're going to have some fun polls for you, things like light theme versus dark theme tabs versus spaces, you know, the usual fun stuff. Pineapple on pizza or not? These are the tough questions that we need answers, and you're going to help us answer those questions. Without further ado, let me introduce our keynote speaker. So on the weekends, he enjoys extreme skiing down treacherous mountains, but during the week, he enjoys extreme development by creating VS Code with his team. Let's get a round of applause for Eric Gamma, technical fellow at Microsoft, and your keynote speaker. Hello and welcome to VS Code Day. Um, as Brian mentioned, the title of the talk is VS Code is an overnight success. That's what many people think, but what these people forget or don't know that it was actually more than 10 years in the making. And it's my big pleasure now in this talk to shed some light in what happened in these 10 years and what this great team uh, that you saw in the intro has built. So without further ado, how did it all start? get started, right? So I joined Microsoft almost 10 years ago. And from my manager, I got kind of this job description that I should really work on online development tooling. Well, in fact, that's why I joined Microsoft, because I was interested in that. Uh, I simplified then the description to just focus on enable coding in the browser with 
the sub sentence that that so that you don't feel like you're coding in the browser, right? Because we don't want to be restricted. We want to have a cool coding experience. That's what we are, are all about. So that was the mission. And the other idea was that we really run as a startup, right? You are a small team in Zurich. And when you run as a startup, you have to think about your deliverables, right? Because you want to be relevant and kind of you want to get funding. And the first thing we built to get funding was what became the Monaco editor. And the Monaco editor was a well-performing editor uh, that leverages the latest HTML5 technology, gives you coloring, IntelliSense, uh, code, and a rich coding experience. Uh, what many people don't know is that we decided to not use any UI frameworks from the beginning, and that's still true today, because performance is very important to us and want to be fully in control of our own destiny. Right. So we don't want to chase uh, a framework or track some performance from in the framework. We want to be directly as close to the DOM as possible. So that was Monaco. We shipped that. The good thing as a startup, we found partners, right? Monaco got adopted by Azure early on and others. And even today, you see Monaco embedded in many, in many applications, which is great. Internally, we are more aggressive, right? We, we immediately said, well, if you build this editor, we want to dog food it is much as possible, and we really want to work towards the web IDE, that we can do full development in the browser. And that led into the Monaco Workbench, which was our internal dog fooding IDE that we built uh, and run locally, right? We had some kind of express server that we connect to, and then that's how we developed it. In order to not lose any work, we always had autosave enabled. This was one of the most important features we had there, right? So autosave, no, never lose your work. And interestingly, we never have the guts uh, to change the default in VS Code to autosave, right? But it's it's a great feature. I think everybody in the team has it enabled. So as a good startup, of course, you want to ship. I mean, you also wanted to ship this workbench. And finally, oh yeah, before we go to the shipping the workbench, the story would not be complete without showing and give some kisses to TypeScript, right? Because this 10 years journey wouldn't have been possible unless we had TypeScript as the tool that helped us to keep our code flexible so they can restructure it. And as you see here, we slowly started the adoption of TypeScript and as the code base grew, we found more and more compelling desire to have everything in TypeScript. And in the last 10 years, right, we refactored major parts of the system like the editor storage or, or the tree widget to really for performance. And this will not have been possible unless we had TypeScript. So in 2013, we were all into TypeScript. So also in this time, by 2013, we had we were ready to ship this workbench in a product. And this was then what we called Visual Studio Online Monaco, which allowed you to edit Azure websites online. And if you look at the screen, you see we had kind of a, an explorer. We had Git integration search. You could run your program and so on. This is all good, we're very happy, but also for a startup, right, when it came to number of users, we have some happy users, but what the most we got was about 3,000 uh, monthly users. And for, for, for Microsoft, it's very hard to be relevant with this number of users. So we had the classical startup challenge that we really had to grow by 10x, right? In fact, by us, it was by 100x more users. The only highlight, I think, from this effort was that even the little kingdom got aware of this effort and they wrote us a letter that they really don't like the name, which we promptly reacted to by putting Monaco in quotes, right? Okay, so that was Visual Studio Online Monaco. And now we had to decide. We want to get to more users, right? What do we do? Do we continue pushing or do we pivot? And the good thing is, at that time, Microsoft changed fundamentally, right? Microsoft as a company moved from run everything on Windows to a cross-platform company, even Azure, not surprising, right? And also, Microsoft wants to be more open and, and, and be attractive to many developers, embracing open source, embracing open standards. So what we did based on that, given desire, we said we want to build a tool that is cross-platform and it targets born on the web developers, right? And these born on the web developers, they use many languages, many tools. 
uh, many different uh, runtimes, so we want to be attractive to them. The challenge is, we said, we want to also have it done by 2015. We were very conference-driven initially, right? For each conference, we'd like to, also as a startup, to get some visibility, right? And Build was the most visible conference, and that's why we were shooting for that. So the next question was, well, what tool do we build? And on one hand, right, born in the web developers, they use editors, right? They like Sublime, Atom, whatever, right? We had some background in IDEs, which we also like. We like code understanding. We, we enjoy debugging. So what you wanted to do is you really want to build a tool that is kind of in the sweet spot in between and that addresses the challenge of supporting many languages, right? You will see this as a common theme as we evolve, as we evolve further. So the next challenge was we had to get from the browser to the desktop. <clears throat> and again, kind of the timing was just lucky for us because at that time, 2014, frameworks emerged which allowed you to develop a desktop application with web technology, right? So we had, there was kind of Node WebKit came along, Atom Shell, which then finally became Electron. And we jumped on Atom Shell because it had a great community and we were very happy with that, right? And Electron improves with every release and allows us to run and build a tool that runs on cross-platform with minimal cross-platform cross testing effort. In fact, but we still dog food. Our team runs on all the different platforms we ship on. So that's kind of also part of our story that we go with Electron from for, to get to the desktop. And in fact, no, we were able to ship that, which was a very happy moment. We we had kind of these checklists, checklists. So we said, what do we have all to do to ship the, the preview? And by May, we were able to do that. Uh, it wasn't announced and it was demoed to and the high. The coolest demo was to demo Linux debugging, uh, .NET debugging on Linux, right? This was really great. So we got lots of uh, great feedback that we are cross-platform, but what people really wanted is an extension story and it should be open source. We also had in mind it should be open source because we cannot build all the languages at Born in the Web Developer World support for all these languages, right? So we had to do that. And since we're conference, conference driven, we said we want to do it by the next conference. Unfortunately, this conference was just six months ahead of us. So this was the Connect conference. But again, no, we were, it was very intense and we got it together and we came up with an extension story. And on the right, you see extensions that were demoed at that time and an extension API. There was kind of Pretty interesting discussion about this, how we support extensions because we have some experience from extensions in the past and other tools like Eclipse that extensions are really cool, but extensions can also hurt you, right? Because when an extension on startup does too much, all of a sudden your tool starts slowly, right? And it delays until it, the cursor starts blinking. And our goal is always in VS Code, we really care. We want to get that the cursor blinks as soon as possible and we, we don't want to be kind of impacted in any way from an extension for doing that. So what we then decided to do is we decided to run extensions in a separate process so that the VS Code core is less impacted by extensions. For instance, right, in the VS Code core, save happens in the core. So an extension that does some weird things or has problems cannot impact the saving, which is a great thing. Also, the API was designed from the ground up, what do we expose to extensions? Because we had the separations, we talked to some RPC uh, to the to this uh, what we call the extension host, and this API is again leveraging TypeScript, nicely specified in the VS Code or and also this separation allows us you now to shield kind of the extension authors from internal implementation details. And but what not many of you know is right. For instance, in the VS Code core. And we address lines and columns in the editor based on a one-based index. In the extension API, because you found it's more, more natural, we fix that and you can address lines and columns it's zero-based, right? So we can nicely shield and hide what we want to do for, for the extension, also make their life simple from what we have implemented in the code. So this extension host you will see is a continuous theme as we evolve VS Code. And the cool demo there at the, this conference was that we showed the Go extension, uh, which showed for the first time some language intelligence, intelligence and was really implemented as an extension. <clears throat> Good. 
Open source, yes, it was announced as well, same time. So what we also did during these six months, we not only came with the extension architecture, we also came up with a uh, cleanse code, right? So we had to really review our code, we had a long checklist we went through, what you have to do to be, so that everybody could see our code. And we did that. And one of the things we did there also, we used this open source pattern to have an open source core and then build a distro on top of it, which bonds additional product specific things that you don't want to share open source, like the Visual Studio, the Visual Studio graphics and so on, which are proprietary. So we made it all happen. And this was pretty good. And you we were very happy at that point. So what was the next challenge you wanted to solve? So as I told you, only the web develops use many languages. What we like from IDEs, we like rich language understanding, right? So that you can do go to definition or get IntelliSense. <clears throat> so the challenge was how do we get support and rich language support for many languages in VS Code? Now we know that we will not appeal to every language developer if a language provider, if there's implementation is only good for VS Code. So for that reason, what we came up with is the language server protocol. So first of all, the first step is that you embed or encapsulate the language brains, the language intelligence in a separate server. And now to help the language provider to make their life easier, they don't have to integrate this language server then in for each different tool because each tool has a different API. So the idea was we kind of standardize the protocol that the tool talks to this language server, to the language intelligence, right? So the language server is the, uh, basically has to know when a file gets opened because then the truth of the file of the, of the language is in the edit in memory and the language server protocol has to synchronize the, the editor state and when in a language request like go to definition comes along, the, the language uh, server will reply to this request. And this was the JSON RPC based uh, protocol. And the first success story of this uh, language server protocol is support for Java, which kind of closed a nice circle, right? Because several of our team, they worked on the Eclipse Java. And what we did in a hackathon with Red Hat, we implemented a Java language server using the LSP protocol. And through that, we got Java support in, in VS Code. And Java is, the support is getting better and better since then. So it's a nice uh, little loop we had and a nice little success story of this language server protocol. So at that point, now we were open source. We had more languages. We, could, uh, we noticed we need some more power. And another timing and nice thing happened at that time, we decided that we want to really grow from this small team in Zurich and you want to have a team uh, also in Redmond, right? And it was really lucky that Kai Metzl, uh, someone I worked with many, many years at Clips, he finished his startup journey and he joined us in Microsoft and built a tool, uh, a team in Redmond, right? And the team immediately started to contribute and one of the initial contributions was this integrated terminal, right? Based on XTermGS which was really great to see. So right, both teams collaborate. And of course, right now you cannot say what the one team or the other task because it's really just we, we succeed together. But what this integrated terminal shows also is that our team not only maintains VS Code, we also maintain component like the Monaco editor or the XTEM.js that are really appreciated by many other tools. And you see them embedded in many different uh, setups. So, then came this planning meeting, right? We were open source, we had extensions, we were pretty happy, but the question was, where do we want to go next? And one scenario we really liked and appealed to us since a long time was, what if you will want to work on a, on a repository, let's say a GitHub repository, and what if you could just say, open me this repository in VS Code, and you can press F5 to run it, you can make changes, create a pull request, and you're happy, right? So that was a scenario that you saw was, is very appealing but it was clear to us it's a longer journey to get there because first you want to maybe run in a browser and you need to wait a story for extensions in the setup that the browser can use these extensions. <clears throat> Again, timing was pretty nice because a new challenge came along and the challenge was that Microsoft provided a WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, right? And the Windows subsystem for Linux allows you to install tools in the subsystem on the Linux side. And now when we have our extensions, we'd like to have 
extensions which can leverage tools installed in the WSL side. So, and this was a challenge because we, we noticed if we do it the, the, the way without any special architectural change, you have to do lots of path mappings, right? Which is really not sustainable. So when you want to launch node in the extension, you have to know you're in WSL. If you're in WSL, you know the path on the WSL side. So this was not really appealing, but what if you could run extensions remotely on the side where the tools are? And Tess has led us to this VS Code remote architecture. And the idea is that we support that you can run extensions remotely, right? So we have basically another remote extension host that runs on the remote side where the file system is, where the tools are installed. And basically what we implement is that the VS Code core talks to, to an agent which manages this remote extension host, which is the same bits as the local extension host and can host extensions like Git or Python. But the cool thing is, when you use the Python extension, it will leverage the Python installed on, on the remote side. Now this architecture, which we call here this VS Code server, this combo of agent extension host, <clears throat> can now be applied to different setups. And these are the setups we initially implemented. WSL was the initial motivation. Then we found another uh, interesting scenario is that you want to run your development tools in a container, in a Docker container, that's the remote container setup. There will be a talk right after this one that goes deeper in that. And the next setup is SSH, right? SSH have an SSH box where you want to do remote development or whatever. And you not only want to connect with Wim or to this tool to edit files, but you want to basically use the full VS code to develop and work on the files which are in this remote SSH box. So far, so good, right? So this basically allows us and gives us a story for running uh, extensions remotely, which is kind of a step towards getting back to the browser because the browser also, the extensions they run on a, on a file system access, they need a remote story. So we could leverage, when you want to go back to the browser, we could leverage this VS Code server, right? What we need to add is we need to add support for HTTP that you can request and load the code from, from the browser that runs this VS Code server. So the other challenge now when it comes to the browser, we were already running in the browser, right? Remember the, this, this Visual Studio Online Monaco, but what we did along the way as we moved to Electron, we leveraged the power of Electron that you can use from your code node APIs. Right, so the VS Code Core used the Node API, the file system API to access the file system to spawn processes. When you want to run in a browser, of course, that's not possible. So we had to go back and basically remove this, this direct use of Node APIs and come up with an architecture that allows us to still have a single source uh, implementation. And what's nice was this gave us a great opportunity to clean up our code, right, because uh, this required no so service injection that we abstract different services like the dialog so that in one on the desktop you get the native dialog and in the browser you get a, an HTML built dialog. So this was an, another great achievement that brought us uh, in 2020 again. It was a longer refactoring to get there, but at the end we had it. And this was then a, the last missing puzzle piece to get finally to the open VS Code scenario. And of course, to get there, was in a collaboration between uh, the VS Code team, GitHub, and another team in Microsoft to make it working. Because what's the idea of this code spaces setup is that you get an, an environment that is managed by the infrastructure, right? For the WSL or remote containers or SSH, you manage, you bring your, your environment. Code spaces manages it for you, and it's nicely integrated in, in GitHub. Right, so and there's now a, a preview available and you can request early access to it. So that was very exciting. And of course, to connect the dots here, not only VS Code can run in, in GitHub, also GitHub can get closer in VS Code. And we do that by having, what else? An extension that can integrate GitHub and allows you to review GitHub pull requests and to review issues and so on, uh, all in, in VS Code. So this was is was is a major milestone milestone in our journey, right? That we get this all connected. So let's look at where we are today, right? And it's uh, I have some nice nice numbers for you here. 
So today we have 14 million monthly users. We have 28,000 uh, extensions from 20,000 authors. We have a pretty good MPS score, right, with this MPS service. So thanks to everybody that answers the surveys, which makes us pretty happy. We have some nice number of remote developers in, with this, in this do-it-yourself setup with SSH and containers. You see here now language servers. There is kind of 138 uh, LSP-based language servers available, which is pretty good. We do the same for uh, debugger. We have a debugger adapter protocol. We have over 50 adapters now that, that can implement the, the, the protocol that is needed to talk to the generic debugger we have in VS Code. And last but not least, I gave it a different color because what might be easy to overlook how intense this time is for us, right? So we closed, since we went open source on GitHub, we closed over 100,000 issues. And actually, it happened just recently. So we just crossed the mark and nobody noticed. So almost sad. OK, so as we went along, there are some things which are constantly never changed, right? And one of the things we do, we ship every month. And this is true since 2011, we ship every month and we have release notes every month to show continuous progress. And this is, if you see here, we plan every month. We have a plan that is a GitHub issue. Everybody can see it. And when you go to GitHub now, you see that we have closed 57 uh, iteration plans, right? Which is quite a number. And what you also do, we are, we want to have that the code is in good shape. So in every iteration, we do depth reduction for one week. We, we really practice listening. We look at highly voted feature requests and so on that we want to see where are the pain points from our users. And of course, you have continuous performance focus with tools that we have a bot that tells us when it got slower and so on. There is a whole separate talk behind how, how we manage to keep the performance up and running as we grow the tool. So where do we go from here? Um, same as iteration plans, we have a roadmap. The roadmaps are public. Unfortunately, this time, this conference did not perfectly align with our roadmap work because the roadmap, the last one ends in 2020. We currently work on a new one, but I can tell a little bit where we are working on, uh, where the investment will go. Uh, a new area is testing. We have code editing, rich code editing support. We have debugging support. So what was missing in the in the whole cycle of developers testing. And we added that, interestingly, we left this part to the community, right? They filled it in, they were very creative. And what we do now, we go back to this community and work with them on, on testing infrastructure. So, and I can show you here a glimpse, right? How this is, this is now an extension which leverages the new testing support for our own VS Code repository and for our tests we run in there. And you see you now we have that that's kind of community inventions, right? They use code lenses to that you can run your test. You can now also new from the gutter. When there's a test failure right in place, you see the, the error message, the failure of the test failure, and you can even see the difference, the delta between the expected and the actual value. So that's um that will come, we'll nest, invest in, and there's great progress on that. Of course, that will also enable the community to contribute then different test runners, different test frameworks. So we'll continue, of course, rely on the community to help us to make this uh, rich experience. Notebooks is very important, right? Like Jupyter. And what you work on is to get really first-class integrated and notebook experience in VS Code. By first-class, we mean no need supports VS Code extensions, like the key bindings, the Vim, if you use Vim key bindings, they work in a notebook, the themes, they work in a notebook, and that it can even extend the renders in the notebooks using VS Code extensions. It's a pretty nice story, and there'll be a talk later today where the, from the Python team, where how they, they leverage this work. And last but not least, now we will continue, of course, to, to uh, make code spaces better and to make this uh, baby ship, help to make this baby ship. So this brings me to the end and basically to summarize what it takes to create an overnight success, right? So I hope you saw from our journey, there were some, some ingredients you have to, to have, right? First of all, you have to be patient, right? We want to ship the web ID in 2013, but technology was not ready. Many things were not ready. We were just too early. So we had to be patient. However, you, have, you also have to be persistent, right? Don't give up, right? So even if it didn't happen, don't give up to, to come back to it. 
What's very important is be fit. What I mean, your code has to be ready. Whenever there's an opportunity, your code has to be in good shape that you can jump in and make it happen, right? But this is nicely what we showed when you make the pivot from the browser to the desktop, right? Because the code was fit, well structured, we could make this happen. Be willing to pivot, right? Be willing to abandon something and start something new. Of course, you were lucky we could leverage a lot of the work we had done. But keep in mind, oh, what makes me thinking, how many active users would we have? We would have kind of not pivoted and tried to continue on the web ID in 2030. And last but not least, right? If you want to create an overnight success, you have to be lucky because things just have to align, right? Microsoft has changed, technology became in place. And if you build this all together, then that explains how we could build this, this nice success in, in 10 years. So this brings you to the end of this talk. And as always, we end the talk with the invitation for happy coding. So Brian, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. That excellent session. And we have a moment to at least do a, a quick question and answer really yeah. quick. Um, so one, I love the, the name of the, the, the talk and uh, it's, uh, you have me laughing that I know you're messing, you know, joking around that it's an overnight su success with VS Code. And it's amazing to hear of the history of the evolution of it overall. Um, so with that in mind though, and all that experience that you have gotten building out VS Code with the team, what would you potentially do differently if you could start from scratch? Let me get some time by telling you what I would not change. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what really helped us is that we started with the web in, in mind, right? We, we started as a web IDE. And why this has helped us so much is because we always had a focus on on performance, right? In the web, you have HTTP requests, right? If you just started to use Electron, you have the file system. You can just access directly. But when it comes to the web, you care about bundling because you care about reducing number of HTTP requests. So you care about uh, reducing uh, the number of round trips to get performance. And I think this is really an explanation why we have a, a good startup performance that we really start web first and then came to the desktop and not the other way around. So I will not change that, even though uh, it would have kind of shortened the development. I think what, what I would change, well, of course, now we, we, we work monthly. So if something is wrong, we, we replan every month, right? So big changes we will correct. There is one conceptual change, if I look back, that I think has caused some confusion in the community. We didn't spend a lot of, not enough time to come with the name of the open source core of VS Code, right? So we just called it code open source. And uh, I think Chrome did a better job, right? They have Chrome as the product, the distro, and Chromium as the open source core. And we don't have such a nice, cool name, and which has caused some confusion. And I guess that's, Something we, if you had more time, you could have done. But to be fair, right, the name VS Code came up five days before we shipped. So we were happy to have one name. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, to so have two good names, that would be almost be asking for too much. Gotcha. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing what you all have in store for VS Code in the future. Thanks for having me here. Excellent. All right. So our next session, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, here's the introduction for our next session. She's a listener of a wide selection of music ranging from pop bands such as One Direction all the way to metal. Your next speaker is ready to rock. Please give it up for Bridget Murtaugh, Program Manager at Microsoft, presenting remote development with Visual Studio Code. Take it away, Bridget. All right. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here so we can get right into it. All right. Great. And if folks can see that, we'll go ahead and get into it. And again, yeah, my name is Bridget, and I'm super excited to be here today to talk about remote development with VS Code. Um, Eric gave a great introduction to remote development for folks who may not be familiar with it. But just to touch on some of the motivations again, um, we are really in an increasingly remote world. Um, there are huge mono repos a lot of folks are working on and with more machine learning and data science and the development of the Windows subsystem for Linux, there's a lot of opportunities to work in isolated and remote environments. 
And with this in mind, we really wanted to provide an optimal remote development experience. Um, so this included um, making sure that folks had access to their source code and avoiding having to duplicate any sort of settings or setup and making sure that it really was a seamless feel and accessing everything in the VS code that you already know and love. Um, so with this in mind, we actually have four remote development experiences. And um, without spending too much time on slides, I'd love to just go ahead and get into some demos. So let's get things started. Alrighty. So I'm going to go over to my desktop here, and we're going to start off with the Windows subsystem for Linux. So WSL is awesome because it gives you a full Linux distro on a Windows machine. So I have access to Linux tools and commands, even though I'm developing on Windows. So right now, I'd love to develop a um, Python Django app, and I actually have Python installed in WSL. See, so yeah, I have Python 3 installed, and I don't actually have that installed in Windows. So you can see I already have an isolated environment installed in um, my Windows environment. So let's go ahead and launch this in VS Code. So right now I'm in an Ubuntu terminal, and I can just launch this with a code dot. So immediately with this code dot, I am brought into VS Code. We can see in the lower left here, I am brought into my Ubuntu environment. And um, with this here, I have a few awesome features. Um, we can see here, it pretty much looks identical to a local um, development experience. I have the same syntax highlighting and completions. Um, I could even set breakpoints. I have a breakpoint here. And if I hover over the paths to my files, they're actually um, true Linux paths, which is great. And if I type in new name here, it actually says Linux. So VS Code truly thinks I'm developing on Linux. If I go over to the extensions view lit, I can even install extensions on the Linux side so I can get a true Python development experience um, within this isolated Linux environment on my Windows machine. So let's go ahead and just try running this app. Um, again, just running a Django app um, on WSL. And I have a breakpoint set, so we're really going to test to see um, how this development experience looks. Alrighty, so it says that it's running at port 8000. So let's go ahead and see how that looks here. So I have that moment of duplication. And all right, awesome. So we're able to run our app. Let's see if the breakpoint hits. It's supposed to happen if we go to this page. Alrighty, I can see VS Code is flashing and our breakpoint was hit. So you can see indeed we have the full development experience that we would expect and hope for locally um, while developing in this isolated or remote environment. Okay, so now that we've started off with WSL, um, let's say that we don't want to necessarily have to worry about installing a tech stack either locally on our machine or even in this um, like WSL distro. Let's say that we would like to just go ahead and um, kind of work in a containerized environment where we could go ahead and share that setup between other projects or between other teammates. Well, that's where our next demo or our next remote extension is going to come into play, and that is known as remote containers. So I'm going to go ahead and exit out of here, which I can do clicking over here, just say close remote connection. And I'm interested in trying out Rust. And I don't really know much about Rust, but I know Remote Containers has an awesome way for me just to spin up a really quick environment for a variety of languages. So I can do, this is the remote indicator. It's like our hub for different remote commands, it gets installed automatically when we have any of the remote extensions. I can say um, remote containers, and I'm going to say try a sample. We have a variety of languages here that we could try out. I'm going to say Rust. And now when we try this here, it's actually going to spin up this isolated Rust environment on my machine. So it's going to set up all of the Rust dependencies that I need while keeping my local computer free and clear of any extra downloads or dependencies. So now I'm actually developing in this Rust environment, but I didn't contaminate my computer with anything else. Um, in any sort of dev environment or dev container that I'm using with remote containers, it's going to add this dev container folder. And I won't get too much into it, but it essentially tells VS Code how to spin up your dev container and connect to it. And if you want to learn more about that, I definitely recommend checking out Johan's session, which is going to be directly after mine, which is going to dive into the awesome world of dev containers even more. So again, if I say uname, it says Linux, because we are in a Linux container environment. 
And now I'm just going to do an F5 again to try running this Rust app really quickly. Let's see what happens. And there we go. Hello, VS Code Remote Containers. And that is the output we were hoping for. So that's super cool. I was able to spin up a Rust environment in just like a matter of seconds there. And I didn't have to worry about um, downloading anything else on my computer. And I could go ahead and share this setup with other teammates or between other projects too. So it's super convenient. So let's say by working in this dev container, now I've gotten so excited about Rust that I have decided, okay, I would actually like to go ahead and contribute to the Rust like source code or language itself. Uh, maybe I come up with some awesome feature while I'm working in my dev container. But I know from some friends that um, actually building the Rust source code is gonna kind of be a lengthy process. And while I have like a decent local computer, um, I think it would be a little bit too much of a task for my local machine to handle. So that's where our next remote extension is going to come into play, where I would actually like to harness the power of an external machine. So with WSL and dev containers, we were kind of working in these isolated environments on our own machine. But with the power of remote SSH, which is the next extension we're going to take a look at, that lets us harness the power of connecting to a virtual machine or a separate desktop machine or something like that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to close out my remote connection. And now going ahead again to the remote indicator, I'm going to do remote SSH connect to host. And here I have a variety of SSH hosts I've already set up. I could add a new host if I wanted to, but this is the VM I would like to attach to because I know this is the VM where I have um, Rust already set up for me. Okay, we can see in the bottom left here, now I'm connected to my Rust VM. And if I go over here to the Explorer, it says connected to remote. And if I say open folder, um, these are actually folders and files on my VM. So now I'm able to navigate on the remote file system, which is super convenient. I'm going to select Rust. And here, I've actually already done a git clone of the Rust um, source code on this VM. Um, so that's already set up for me, which is super convenient. And yeah, so we can see here, I have the readme open, the Rust programming language, close out these notifications for now. And just by looking at this, I can see it has quite a few dependencies required. And I'd really like to keep my local computer free of all these dependencies. And again, um, I think this would take probably at least two or three hours to build on my local machine. But this VM is super powerful. I think I chose one with 64, 72 cores, something like that. So let's go ahead and try building this um, and see like how many cores it has. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and choose the command here to build and install. All right, and while that goes, I'm just gonna open up a split terminal here and do htop, which is a nice command we can do to go ahead and look at core and CPU utilization. All right, and this is just cool. So we can go ahead and see that I definitely have way more cores available on this remote VM than I would have available locally. And it's just kind of a neat thing to be able to take a look at and see how all those cores are being utilized. They're definitely being lit up, um, way more utilized. And um, yeah, this is a really convenient um, tool, um, remote SSH, so that way I can access source code and libraries and a way more powerful machine than I have available locally to me. All right, and so this would take some time, but I'll let this go ahead and just run. Now, finally, like Eric mentioned, also at the end of his keynote, we have GitHub Code Spaces, which is another awesome tool that really takes care of a lot of the setup and containerized development environment for you. And it has great integration with GitHub and like pull requests and committing to your repos. And if we wanted to, we could go ahead and connect to a code space directly in our desktop VS Code client. So I could go over here to the Remote Explorer. And if I click on the drop down, I can choose a variety of targets. So I could connect to a code space along with any other containers or SSH targets or even um, WSL distros. But we can also connect to code spaces in the browser. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like in the browser. So I'm going to go over to the browser. And here I have um, a nice app. Um, or repo in the browser and cl click the drop down menu here and say open with code spaces. 
I already have a code space here, so we're going to open it and see what it looks like. And once it loads, we're going to see that it looks pretty similar um, to our local VS Code. So it's going to be the environment we already know and love, which is super nice. Alrighty, and we're going to see we have a terminal available. We have um, a lot of the same options here, like running and source control and even extensions. Um, and we're also going to have the ability to debug and syntax highlighting and completions, which is super nice. So let's go ahead and just try running this app. OK, create that, do npm run server, server. Okay, and then let's start our app. There we go, We're starting things up there. Okay, it should be available at port 3000. If I go over here, we can see our ports. Let's open it up and there we go. And our app is successfully running in the browser. So we can see we have an awesome experience in the browser with GitHub code spaces, just like we would want locally. Alrighty, so I know that was a whirlwind of demos and information all about remote development with VS Code. Um, here I have a final slide of some resources, including some docs and some ways you can reach us. But yeah, I'll kick it back to you, Brian. And thank you so much, everyone. And happy coding. Excellent. That was awesome, Bridget. Stick around for just a few more minutes. We're going to do some Q&A. So folks, if you're, you watched the session, you enjoyed it, and you have some questions for Bridget, feel free to drop them in the chat room, and we'll do our best to get them asked over here. Um, first off, Bridget, that was awesome. Like, It's amazing to see the, how powerful dev containers can be um, and just make things simpler for us in terms of developers to spin up something and, and tinker a bit without having to modify things on our local machine. One question for you right off the bat is there was, there's been mention of code spaces. So I think uh, Eric mentioned it, you mentioned it a little bit. Can I use a dev container in a code space? Is, that, is there a possibility of doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you absolutely can use a dev container in a code space. And you can actually use the same dev container setup in both the remote containers extension and in a code space. So once you get familiar with that dot dev container folder that includes a dev container dot JSON and a Docker file, you can use that same setup between um, both extensions or both experiences, which is really nice um, because then you can move between both of them and your repos can really move between both experiences nicely. Awesome. And as a follow up to that, can I use that same dev container both in with use of remote containers extension in VS Code and in code spaces? Yes, absolutely. And then um, we actually have the ability in both experiences, there's a command to add development container configuration files. And that's going to go ahead and pull from the same repo to add the same development con container configuration files. So you're going to have a consistent setup and a consistent container configuration. So that way you know that your projects are going to have the same tool sets and um, yeah, you and your teammates can have a really consistent and smooth setup experience. I should have known that there was a command. When in <laughs> doubt, there is a command in VS Code that can help you out. Uh, and, and the command palette is like the, the gateway to everything VS Code. Excellent. That's awesome to hear. Um, don't see any questions from the chat just yet. But another question for you. Uh, are there any, what's, what's the platforms that is capable of doing remote development like this? Is there any limitations there or? What, what are our options as developers? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so remote development, you can do it. Um, it's cross-platform, just like VS Code is. So you can do it um, from any platform, um, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, and you can also remote into any platform. Um, the containers that we are using are Linux-based. That's something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, so you can do it from cross-platform environments. Excellent. That's good to hear. Um, a question in the chat when well you may not know the answer to this but when can other folks start signing up and using code spaces and these dev containers in there 
you can definitely start signing up for code spaces now. Um, so the link is available to sign up now. Um, yeah, I'm not sure the exact access date or anything like that, but the, the link for the beta is available now if you go to that GitHub code spaces link. Cool. And one last question for you, a little bit of a personal one, but what's your favorite part of remote development in VS Code? Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, I, I really love a lot of parts of it, but one of my favorite parts is that now I think we're really not restricted by the hardware that we personally have. So as developers or um, really from any background, including students, um, we have way more capabilities to execute more powerful programs and to really achieve more and be even more productive. So I think that's a really awesome ability we have now. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Bridget. It was a great session. And I uh, learned you. a lot. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So up next, folks, we're going to take a little bit of a break. We're going to hear from um, a company that we're working with as part of this event. And so let me introduce you to the video you're about to see. Now, we're pleased to welcome Tradewater, an organization that is working to make this event climate positive by safely collecting and destroying the most harmful greenhouse gases in the world. I had a chance to sit down with Kevin Schwarzenberg to learn more about what they do. Let's take a look. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Brian. You're doing a fantastic job. Keep it up. Now, while I'm here, let's welcome in Kevin Schwarzenberg from Tradewater. Hey, Kevin. Hey, how's it going, Brian? It's going good. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, one of the first questions that come to mind here is, what is Tradewater and what is the challenge you all are trying to address? Sure. So Tradewater is an environmental project development company, and we're focused on improving the environment and creating economic opportunity through the collection, control, and destruction of potent high-impact greenhouse gases. Over the life of the company, we've prevented 4 million tons of greenhouse gases from going into the atmosphere and are working towards a goal of 3 million tons per year. Wow, that is quite the challenge and what an initiative you all are being a part of. One thing I have in mind, in mind here that I'm wondering as I was checking out some of the technology you all have developed and are using to help reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Can you tell me as you were developing all that, what is some cool technology or innovative project you came across that surprised you? Yeah, I think one of the coolest things we've been working on lately is the ability to fractionalize offset credits. Um, so the, the credits that we generate come in quantities that are equivalent of one metric ton of CO2, which is fine if you're offsetting a lot of emissions like from a business or from a household for an entire year. Right. Um, but what we've done is developed a tool and a technology to track fractional offsets down to the gram of CO2 equivalent, which allows us to sell offsets for things as big as the footprint of a business for a year or as small as a cup of coffee um, and pretty much anything in between. Gotcha. Now, I'm not very knowledgeable in this space. So there are some terms you use there that were kind of new to me that I'm hoping you can elaborate on. So in particular, you mentioned things like offsetting and credits. Could you elaborate a bit more in detail on what that means for someone like myself? Yeah, so basically what a carbon offset credit is, is a certificate that confirms that greenhouse gases were either collected and destroyed or prevented from being emitted or sequestered from the atmosphere. Um, and our, our offsets um, typically represent the equivalent of one metric ton of carbon dioxide. Gotcha. Interesting. And then you also mentioned that you're destroying these gases. So how do you go about doing? It? How do you go about doing that? Yeah. So our projects focus on um, a greenhouse gas uh, called CFCs. These were refrigerants and propellants and aerosol products. Uh, and in the 1990s, it was discovered that they were causing a hole in the ozone layer. Mm. Um, so there was an international treaty called the Montreal Protocol, which banned production and drastically decreased their use, which was really successful in helping the ozone layer. But one of the problems that it didn't solve is the fact that there's still stockpiles of this material out in the world. In addition to being bad for the ozone, it's a really potent greenhouse gas. Um, one pound of this, this gas has the same climate impact as almost 11,000 pounds of CO2. So our projects are centered around identifying that material in stockpiles around the world collecting it, uh, safely handling it, and having it destroyed so it doesn't end up being emitted into the atmosphere. Wow, this this is all really amazing. And I'm really proud to say that as part of VS Code Day, we've committed to being climate positive by partnering with you all. And to the effect of not only are we going to be offsetting the emissions for this event, but we're going to be offsetting over 10 times that of our footprint for this event. So 
thank you so much for your part in helping out with that. And in addition to this, I'm, I'm wondering, and I imagine folks at home are wondering as well, how can they take part in helping in this effort? What can, where can they go to learn more? Yeah, the best place to go to learn more is to our website, which is tradewater.us. Um, we have more information there about our work, the type of projects we develop. We even have a little FAQ section about how carbon offsetting works. Um, and in addition to that, we have a series of carbon footprint calculators that people can use. And that'll help them understand the emissions associated with their household, um, their travel, their events, uh, and even their businesses. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Kevin. And I wish you the best of luck on your mission to just collect and destroy all of that gas. Thanks, Brian. Well, those are really uh, helpful words of encouragement to myself prior to that. So I'm glad to hear. <laughs> but uh, speaking of trade water, I checked it out myself. You can go in and look at the calculator and figure out what you might be doing as a standard household or you know, your situation, how many people are in your household. and can help you calculate uh, how much carbon emission you might be creating and you can help cut that out of the, you know, the, the world. Um, in addition, on another note, reminder to you all that we're running polls. The current poll that should be running right now is a light theme versus dark theme. What's your favorite? My answer is both. The reason it's both is I use one that's a, an extension that helps me switch between light and dark themes depending on the time of day. You can check it out. It's called Sundial. Look it up on the VS Code extension marketplace. All right, without further ado, let's jump into our next session. Uh, he's dropping beats and ripping it up on the ones and twos. Your next speaker will teach you about the ones and zeros for setting up your best development environment. Please join me in welcoming DJ Johan Lasorsa, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft, presenting a clean development environment working every time, everywhere. Take it away, Johan. Hi, Brian. Thanks for the introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm really glad to, to be with you tonight. So uh, I'm presenting myself. I'm Johan, and I'm a Senior Cloud Developer Advocate working here at Microsoft. And if, like me, you like working in a clean environment, then I think this talk is for you. I'll just start by telling you the story of a developer that lands on a new project. So what happens when you're getting started in your new project? First thing first, welcome to the team. And then, usually, you're given up uh, the dock to set up your environment, provided there's one. After that, you take some time to install all the required tools to prepare your environment and start working on the project. But what usually happens next is a few days later, you still don't have a working environment. And I've been that developers a few times already. So what happens? First thing usually is that maybe the documentation is not up to date, but frankly, uh, I can't be blaming the developers because I've been there and uh, since it's not every day that you welcome a new developer, new project. So probably that uh, taking time to update the docs uh, every week or so uh, might not be worth it. Also, uh, surely you probably have installed on your envi local environment the tools that were in the doc, but maybe not the exact same version that you need to be able to work on your new projects. Or maybe that you, the tools that you already have installed conflicts with other projects or other environments you have set up for working on different things. So the thing is, we already know how to solve these problems because we had the same issues for the runtime environments when we were shipping applications to productions. And we solved these issues by packaging our runtime environments into containers. So why not use containers for development environments? So again, I, I will be focusing on container this time, but I will be also speaking about the remote development uh, extensions for VS Code that Bridget uh, just presented earlier. So now I'll start by showing you how it works concretely on a, on a project. So let me switch to my desktop here. OK. So now you can see my VS Code open here on a project I just cloned. This is a new project. Uh, it's a C Sharp Web API that I, I need to start working on. So obviously, I have VS Code installed with this remote uh, development extension installed, but I don't have any tools needed to work on it. If I try, for example, to use the, the .NET CLI, uh, you can see that it's not working because I did not have installed anything. So of course, I could like open a C Sharp file, make some modification, but I, won't, I wouldn't be able to like build a project or run it to test if everything's working correctly. So what can I do? If you take a look at the status bar in the bottom left here, you can see this little green icon. 
If I click on it, I have this option. Uh, I can choose reopen the project in a container. So what it will do, it will reload VS Code. But this time, instead of uh, being able to work in my local environment set up uh, on my machine, you can see already that I have like a different shell here. Uh, previously, I was using Z shell. That's the shell I have installed on my local machine. But now uh, it's a bash. And for example, if I try the .NET command again, you can see that this time it's working. There are some times that uh, that has been done. And um, this thing is that I'm now connected. Uh, you can see that in the status bar in the bottom, you can see that I'm connected to my uh, development container. So how does it work? You can see here at the top that I have this .dev container folder. And this folder contains two files. The first one is a regular Docker file. You may be already uh, familiar with it. So this Docker file, basically, uh, it tells what kind of environment I need to work on this project. So here I'm using a pre-built image uh, provided by Microsoft. But if I need any tools that are not provided in this, I can just customize the, this file and add any tool I might need to be able to work on my project. The second one is also interesting. It's called devcontainer.json, if I open it. You can see there that I have a few options uh, to set up how I want to work in this specific development uh, container environment. You can see that I can change the name. The name is what will be uh, shown in the bottom, so we can be sure that you're connected to the right environment. I can specify here uh, which Docker file I need to use. You can set up some settings you want uh, for building your Docker file. For, for example, if you need to change a few settings uh, for your particular uh, setup. And then you have also another inter interesting options. So you saw earlier that the bash used uh, when I'm connected to this development container is not the same one I'm using locally. This is because here in this settings part, I can choose to set different settings uh, for when I'm working in this specific container environment than the settings I have locally on my machine. That means that you can set specific VS Code settings that will be used uh, for every developer on your project that will uh, start working using this uh, specific container environment. So this, this is great for sharing settings, uh, specific VS Code settings from, the, from other developers in the project. There's also another cool thing here is that you have the option to specify extensions that will be installed uh, when I'm working in, again in this specific uh, container environment. So here you can see that I have the C Sharp extension and if I open here on the left, the extension tab, you can see that I have a pane with my local extension as usual. But I have also a new one. Uh, these are here, uh, the C Sharp extension is in installed inside the development container and not uh, on my local machine. Meaning when I close this project and I work on, a, on another one, I won't have this extension available. That means uh, you can clearly have complete separate environment. Uh, you can also have your own extension installed and shared within uh, developers of your project for this particular development container. That means you won't have conflicts of different extensions. Uh, for example, if I'm working on a Java project, I surely don't want to have this extension in, uh, enabled. So that's really neat for keeping all things clean. And last thing, is that also have the option to forward specific ports. Because uh, as you know, containers are completely isolated environments. But in this case, I'm working on a, on a web API. So if I want to be able to test this API and see if things are working, I need to be able to connect uh, to my API from the outside world, meaning my local machine. So this time, if I try to run the project, uh, let's run this project to see how it's working. You can see that it's building the project. It will take some time. And then uh, what it will do, it will run uh, the server as usual, but within the container. And I will try, OK, you can see that it's running on my uh, localized environment on port 5000. But it's within the development container. So if I didn't specify any uh, anything, I wouldn't be able to connect to, to this container. But because I've set up here to forward these two specific ports, if I switch back to my local browser and try to hit this URL, you can see some JSON here, meaning that I can still access my, uh, the, my server running inside my development environment as usual. So here, that's great. 
I've shown you how to uh, to be able to to work in your environment. Let me just conclude that by reopening the same project but locally. Just because, uh, as I've said uh, in the title of my talk, I like to keep things clean. So this time I've disconnected from this container. It was closed, and I'm again on my local environment. And you can see that I still don't have uh, any tools uh, related to, to C# -sharp and .NET installed on my local machine. It's all within the container. So everything is clean uh, inside this development container. Now, what if I want to get started on a new project? How do I set up a project to be able to work like that? So I move on to a completely blank uh, VS Code project. So uh, just to give you a bit of context, I'm a JavaScript developer, uh, mainly myself. So I have uh, an old Node.js environment installed locally on my machine. So I can show you that uh, locally I have the V12 version of Node.js installed here. But for this new project, uh, I would like to be able to use the latest Node.js version. So how do I do that? Again, I click on the bottom left to open the, the extensions tools. I will select this time add development container configuration files. So what will uh, appear is a list of possible container configuration already uh, prepared for you. So you can see that I have already a lot of options here. For example, working with C++, Dart, C Sharp, F Sharp, Java, or Node.js. That's what I will choose here. I'll choose the latest uh, uh, LTS version, version 14. And what it will do, it will create these two files, the Docker file and the dev container.json file. So next thing, if I if I want to get started and uh, to work on this project, I do the same thing as last time. I open again the extension and select reopen in container. It will switch back uh, to the container. The first time it might take a while because it's, it will be building the, the Docker image, but the, the first, uh, the later run will be uh, faster. So, okay. It will open here my new environment. It may be a bit uh, tough for my computer. Uh, okay, so now if I try to run the Node.js version, you can see that uh, I now have version 14 available. So meaning I'm still connected uh, to the container environment and uh, I, I will have no issue working on different projects, having different version of, uh, of the tools I need. So that's really a neat thing here. So moving back to uh, my slides, let me switch back. Here to the slide. I have one last thing I would like to, to show you. Uh, that it was already presented uh, in the introduction and also uh, in uh, Bridget's talk, but it's code spaces. Because everything I demonstrated you uh, from using a local container environment, you can do it uh, directly on GitHub. And what's the advantage is? Uh, the thing is, maybe you're working uh, on a machine that's not a developer machine, so it doesn't have enough RAM, enough CPU to be able to, to be uh, working um, comfortably with your project. Or maybe you don't even want to install VS Code or Docker or the remote extension on your machine. You basically have nothing. So here, if I switch back again uh, to my browser, You can see that this GitHub contains the exact same C Sharp project I've shown you earlier. And in this code button, I have this code space extension. For that, uh, of course, since it's in early access, you have to, to be enrolled into that. So I will put my, uh, my glasses to, to give you a glimpse of the future of uh, what you may be uh, able soon to, to do is like, uh, once you click on this Open in Code Spaces button, you get this exact same uh, friendly VS Code environment that I've just shown you earlier. But if you notice the difference is that now I'm running completely in my browser, meaning that I don't need to have anything installed on my local machine. And I can still have the exact same tool that were uh, available locally when I was connected to my local container. But this time, I'm working completely uh, on the web in GitHub Code Space. So that's really great. For example, uh, if you're a contractor and uh, if you want like uh, to work a few days on a project but don't want to to uh, set up everything on your machine, 
this is a great way to be able to like uh, just maybe prepare a pull request uh, or help fix a quick bug uh, in any project uh, in your company. So that's it for my talk. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, every resources, every repo uh, I've shown on the slides also for this talk will be available at this URL. You can scan this QR code to, to get right into it. And uh, thank you for, for listening. If you have any question, you can use the chat. Or uh, if I can't answer it right now, you can always uh, message me on Twitter later. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Johan. So uh, one, I have to ask those glasses. Can you put those back on? The glasses. Can you hear me, Johan? Hey, yes. Yeah, yeah. Those glasses. Do you usually code with those glasses on? Right? Uh, that will be a bit difficult. It's, uh, it's like just special glasses to, to take a look into the future. But uh, yeah, okay. that's really practical for coding. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right. So one quick question for you. Um, so this was great. It's fantastic scene, you know, setting up using containers. In some situations, you might have a more complex development environment, right? So what if you need more than one container? How would you approach doing that? Exactly. What I've shown you in this demo is uh, show you like the, the basic workflow if you need to connect to one single container. But once you, you start uh, working with container, usually you start having a lot of containers. For example, uh, if you're working on a web project, you might need to spawn a database in its separate uh, container. And of course, you can do that. It will require a bit more setup, but uh, let just me tell you that you can have as many containers as you need for, new, for your project. And instead of a single Docker file, you can specify to use a Docker compose.yaml uh, file that you can use to set up a complete environment, uh, meaning if you need to have multiple containers, you can have as many as you need. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, and then there's some questions coming from the chat, but I think it might be best to answer over Twitter. But just to give you a heads up, folks are asking about how you would add Z shells, Zush, to the container. Um, when you run a Docker image or container, is it? Is this always running on your local machine? Maybe you can answer that one, actually. Is it always running on your <laughs> local machine? Uh, for now, I have set up Z shell on my local machine. And honestly, I didn't uh, try to set up one in a container. So that might be try interesting to try. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Johan. Thank you, Brian. Have a good one. All right, folks, we're going to be transitioning to our next session. But really quick, update on the poll. It looks like Dark Themes won on that poll. The new poll that's going out is, what is your preferred way to work when you are remote, either from home office, couch, or stay in bed all day. I would, I would prefer to stay in bed all day. That said, without further ado, let's introduce our next session. The next speaker lists their license to operate a forklift on their CV to keep interviewers on their toes. I like that. Today, he's going to help you gain a license to resolve issues in your web apps in this next presentation on bringing Edge's dev tools to VS Code for debugging web apps. Please help me welcome Chris Howman, Principal Program Manager at Microsoft, and your next speaker. Hey, Chris. Hello, well, let me start sharing my slides and hopefully everything works out. That was quite some artistic license you took there in the introduction. I like that. <laughs> so, okay, I'm Chris and I hope you can see my slides. If not, the video is going to be available later on as well. Uh, I'm a principal program manager at Microsoft. I work on the Edge team and especially on the developer tools inside the Edge browser. If you haven't used that one yet, please do. It's a great browser. It's available on all platforms on all platforms where VS Code is available as well. And today I want to talk to you a bit about how to make it easier to debug web applications with Visual Studio Code. Specifically, I want to talk about something called context switching. And uh, this may not be a thing that you are aware of, and you may not see it as a problem, but I find it as something that is most grating as a developer. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in, as a web developer, we work in three contexts. We write code in an editor. We then go to the browser and tweak it and change it and see if our CSS really did the things they were supposed to do. And once we're happy with that, we go to the terminal and there we do your, your version controlling, your building, your bundling, and your basically your deployment are the things that you do from that. Um, you might already see the problem here. We're actually using three tools and we need to be experts in all these tools, or at least we need to know a bit about each of them. That's a cognitive overhead that I think makes us less effective as developers. And as web developers, we're used to this. I've been a web developer for 25 years, and I never had one thing that did it all. And if it was one thing, it did horrible things to the web. But people coming from other platforms are expecting one IDE to do that one thing. And as Eric explained this morning, VS Code was never meant to do that. And other IDEs that 
to me are far too heavy to do that kind of stuff. But it seems like when I come from another platform to the web, because of that change into different tools all the time and having to think about that, it seems like the web tooling space is less effective than the other places. And that's sad because the web is actually quite great and I'm very happy to be part of it. So we tried uh, now to get rid of all these context switching that you have to jump from one tool to the other just to do a task. And the first attempt was actually in the developer tools themselves. Like you do your testing in the developer tools, but we also thought like, what about going back to the coding editor all the time? So um, if you look at them, what we have right now in the developer tools, there's a full-fledged editor in there. You can not only tweak some CSS things, but if you click on, an, on a file name of a CSS file, you get into an editor. This is not based on Monaco. This is still an older version of, uh, uh, of CodeMirror. So it's actually not on par with what VS Code does. But back then when that was a thing, uh, it was quite amazing that you actually just need a browser to, to start developing. And when I did trainings where I couldn't install things on people's machines, this was a great way to get them started. But when you look at the uh, functionality of it, you've got an editor in there and you've got a full breakpoint debugging environment, a JavaScript breakpoint debugging environment, all the things that you need right in the browser. Now, when we look at the usage stats of that, however, I think the proper term would be to say it's suboptimal. Because uh, we kind of know that you can always replace one great breakpoint with like 12 random console logs throughout your code base, and that does the same thing. So we don't see much uptake on that editor change, but at the same time, we see a huge uptake on the visual tools that we're doing. So this is debugging the CSS. This is actually on finding out what something is. On the top, you see here the new overlay. If you overlay or something after inspecting it, you see the HTML name of it, the colors, the measurements, and also accessibility information. You get things like if it's keyboard accessible and what role and what uh, what structure it has. We also added more things like a color picker that gives you like a color selection from what is in the CSS. And we now started doing font editor in there as well and CSS grids debugging and CSS flexbox debugging because uh, CSS has become quite heavy. So we realized that the big win of the developer tools are these visual tools that allow you to fix your code much better. On the editor side, Visual Studio Code is one of my biggest happiness moments when it came out. I just joined Microsoft when Visual Studio Code came out and I came from Mozilla, so I was all this open source guy and I'm like, this is incredible. Uh, and what the context switching in VS Code win to me is that it has this integrated terminal and the Git integration and also linting options. If you haven't used it yet, there's an extension called WebHint that's also partly done by my team, which allows you to find a lot of mistakes that you're doing in your code before you actually write them. So it actually puts squiggly lines under something when something is wrong, much like CSS linting or, J or JavaScript linting does for you as well. But what I love most about this one is that the deployment and the coding becomes in one editor. I don't have to jump to the terminal and I have to do things there. I can keep it inside VS Code directly without being as heavy as other IDEs like Xcode or Visual Studio is. So this was another one where we got one, rid of one context more to make sure you don't actually need to jump and need to know everything around there. And it may not be a big thing for us, but explaining Git to people and the command line to people is quite a barrier for people that start web development. And I love that with the integration of Git inside VS Code, we can concentrate on doing proper commenting rather than just doing the learning about all the shortcuts and all the Git commands. So the other thing that changed a lot lately is that uh, Visual Studio Code, for example, is completely hackable. It's completely open. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript inside uh, inside Electron, and browsers themselves are not these black holes that they used to be as well. We had no idea what browsers were when I started as a web developer and what could, what they could do. We also had no insights what's coming next as functionality, and all of that is now open. But more importantly, you can actually automate browsers in the background. You can let them run silently in the background. You can send requests to them, and you can get, for example, the website that you wanted to see as an image back. That's great for continuous integration, for testing, and using WebDriver, you can, you can automatically control everything that's going on in the browsers. All of our testing in the developer tools is done that way, so we don't click them bit by bit. We actually have a script that runs through them. And that started with Selenium, and now we've got Playwright and all the other things to automate that, and also based on the WebDriver component here. 
<laughs> we also can embed browsers nowadays better, like the with a web view and now the web view too. These are evergreen browsers inside other applications. In the past, it was always an outdated browser somewhere else or a web view that was only limited. But now you can do the whole thing that the browser does inside other environments and other applications. And that's really useful. And what, one of my main things that I liked about Visual Studio Code is that it's extensible. The extension API is actually pretty uh, um, OK to use. It's easy to understand. I don't want to say easy, because easy might be different for different people. But I found it at least properly documented. And that's something I didn't expect from a lot of other tools, or I, I had bad experiences in the past. And many things that made a Visual Studio Code a success for other people was the extensions that came with it. So we thought about. Why don't we merge the two together? Why don't we take the uh, efforts to cut down on context switching of Visual Studio Code and on Edge and see what we can do together? And that's exactly what we did. And we created an extension called Microsoft Edge Tools for VS Code. I know that's a mouthful, but we need to do that because of licensing reasons and all kind of stuff, much like when Eric talked earlier about Monaco and that we had to put the quotes around it. Uh, it's an extension that's been around for a year now. It actually has quite some good download numbers. But I want more, and I want you to actually tell us what we could do better to make this even more useful for you. And that's why I do this session and also be available later on for questions and answers for everybody around there. And, but what, it, what does it do, actually? This is what it looks like. Uh, well, one of the things it does is you can, you can connect to an instance of a browser, and it will open the browser with the developer tools directly open in the editor. And you can use those cool visual tools to tweak things and to fix things around. But this time, when you click on the CSS link, for example, you edit it directly in Visual Studio Code, meaning you have a browser inside the Visual Studio Code environment without jumping to the browser and back. You don't need to integrate it like that. You can also have it in an external window. But there is an issue with it, which I'm going to come back to in a second. The point now is that actually we brought the tooling, the visual tooling that people use from the browser inside VS Code. And we have the power of the VS Code editor next to that one rather than having an editor that's quite outdated and not as useful as our usage numbers shows. So what you can do right now is actually you can inspect, edit, and tweak the DOM structure of the product you build using the tools that you're used to from the browser. You can inspect network requests. So we put the network tab in there as well. You can interact with the browser inside VS Code. So this is not a, a, a stream or a cast or a video. This is actually a full browser. You can click in it. You can, you can enter uh, content in it. You can test it like any other browser window as well. And you can sync changes with your code. So if you set up source maps and watchers, it's basically a two-way direction. Uh, twitch, uh, changing it in the styling tools, changing in the code will reflect in both of them. You can choose a different version of Edge that you want to run. So it could be the stable version, which probably is what your end users are using. But you can also use the developer edition or the Canary, which is a daily build. And you can choose an own browser window. If you have, for example, a second screen, that's a great way to do. Or you can choose to get it embedded inside the tool itself, which is something that I prefer for obvious reasons, which I'm going to come to in a second. It wouldn't be VS Code Day if we wouldn't open the, the, the hood a bit and uh, tell you what's going on and show you a bit about the warts and problems that we encountered. And the first thing that we realized, we as, as Microsoft, we have to make everything accessible to people with screen readers and keyboard. Like that's a that's a out of the box. We can't get into a full stable release without doing that. And making a complex interface like the developer tools and HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and still keeping them accessible to screen readers and other assistive technology was quite a task. It became even more of a task as soon as we embedded it inside an iframe, inside an extension, inside VS Code, which is also written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But we learned a lot of tricks, and the VS Code team is very helpful there that we actually made it happen as well. There are quite some differences in keyboard handling between Mac and PC. For example, I'm a Mac user, and I realized I couldn't copy and paste into the URL field of that browser if it was embedded. So we needed to fix that one. So there's a few fixes in the source code of the extension as well. And macOS doesn't like browser windows running in the background. Like when you have a window, then you say, like, I can make an external window, and the window is not visible. For some reason, it actually reported itself as non-active in the extension which was really frustrating. You, uh, and the fun thing was you had to move your window a bit smaller and the browser window and just show a few pixels of the browser window, and then it was still active. So that was a bug we couldn't fix. So we actually uh, in, uh, tried to set we're going to the headless version where you can embed it, and that made it much easier. If it's on a different screen, then it's, then it's OK. If it's on one screen, then we had an issue with that. 
The other issue is that Electron lags behind Chromium a bit. Like it's it's an older version of Chromium that runs inside Electron. So not all the functionality, the bleeding edge functionality that we have in the canary build of the developer tools is available in the extension. So that's something to also consider if you really want to do something with a hardcore Chromium extension like we do. So the feature history is interesting. Like we, we, we looked at the features, what we should build by asking you. We wanted to get feedback. And we also looked at the telemetry of the browser, like what people used in the browser developer tools were most likely the things that you want to see in that extension as well. So the element tool was the first one. Everybody uses that one, like the visual editors in there. The network tool was next, because network inspection is an interesting one as well. And then we re-architected the whole thing. We realized that contribution to the extension is kind of tough when you have to build the whole of Chromium just to change a typo. So we changed the architecture and made you only load the things that you need from the Chromium core to actually contribute to it. And that made it much easier for third party developers to also help us with building that thing. We allowed for any version of Edge. We previously, it was only the Canary version. And again, that doesn't have as many users and probably gives you false positives of what's possible in your final product. And we added Edge driver as a dependency. Before that, you had to install the driver. <coughs> Sorry. And now it's bundled with the extension, so you don't need to install two things. It's automatically putting the thing in that it needs to do. You don't have to worry about that anymore. The headless mode was next to fix the issue with macOS. And then we also thought about themes. There's dark and light theme right now. We're trying to match the themes from VS Code, but it's actually tough to do. So something that we're working on, but we will see if we can get it done. So what's next? Um, I, I wish you tell us, like, we really want to do things that you use later on. We want to put things in there that people want, not what we think might be a good idea. So the whole thing is on GitHub. It's, that's where we do our interaction with our end users as well. And what the telemetry says of the browser also, it tells us what we want to build next. Now I'm saying that I only want to do things that you tell me, but I'm going to tell you one thing right now that we're doing. And I want to have some feedback and see what you think. One idea that we're having right now is that inspecting the network is a great thing, but it's not quite enough when, you, when it comes to development. Often we have like a 404 or we have some API that doesn't give it the right data back and we want to know how to inspect that. What was the problem that caused it that the information didn't come back? And that's why we have a new extension, uh, a new experiment in the developer tools that you can use in the browser right now called Network Console. That one allows you to edit and resend any request and when you use that one, you get an interface, much like any third party tool. Again, one context that you need to go to and back that allows you to tweak all the different settings of the request, change the request parameters, and also find out if the right data comes back. So if you think that's a good idea to put into that extension, if that's something that's missing, that's what we're working on next. Or if you say no, then we're probably working on something different. So if you want to get in contact with us, uh, context, <laughs> if you want to get in contact with us, uh, this is the Edge Dev Tools on Twitter. This is me in the middle bringing coffee for everybody. Uh, then there's Zohair, Rachel, and Erica. They're all working on the same team. You can download the extension at AKAMS Dev Tools for Code with dashes in between. And you can visit us on GitHub. And please come and play with us. And that's all I had to present for today. Thank you very much. Excellent and well done, Chris. Uh, it sounds like you had context switching on the mind when you were saying contact there, right? Yeah, it's a it's a thing. It's, it's like when thing. you write these slides, you keep using it. It's a normal. It's very common that you actually do that. Gotcha, gotcha. So I noticed. I, I know you mentioned in the presentation that there were some things that you learned from this, but I imagine there was probably a lot, and it was hard to fit all that onto one slide. So what? Qu one question I have for you is: What was the biggest or one of the biggest hurdles you all faced when building out the extension? I think the, the, uh, that we're embedded in another environment is something that was problematic because we're already inside the browser and we, we, uh, we find out that we, that we can do a few things there. But making the keyboard access, for example, switching by tabbing, going from one thing to another, getting from VS Code into the extension and back was something that we found kind of tricky. Um, other than that, the other problem was the, the difference of the versions of Chromium that we that we always lag a bit behind, so we cannot use some of the new functionality. But in general, the the benefit is that in the VS Code environment, we have much more power than we will have in the ever ever have in the browser. Because in the browser, we're for example beholden to the uh, sandbox of security, whereas in VS Code, I would uh, and that's what I'm thinking about next. 
how can we actually integrate much much more into your workflow of VS Code rather than just clicking the link and going into the editor? How can we take the higher fidelity of a code editor and do something with that in that extension? Because um, it's it's a new place to play, and especially the network to the network console. If we put it in there, that's going to have much more power in VS Code than it has in the browser. Because we, for example, we don't have the problem with setting cookies and reading cookies, which we can't do in a browser. Uh, outside of that, so we would be in the same context as VS Code. So I'm excited about putting more functionality into that one. I also want to give a shout out to the uh, to the engineers that we have on there. It's two people on there. It's like Michael and and Vidal, and they're incredible. It's just it's it's so amazing what you can do with a few engineers. And as somebody who knows code as well as a PM, it's it's wonderful to see how an open product like VS Code can be extended by us without actually having to ask anybody. We just look at the source code and go for it. And that's wonderful. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to see the future of the extension and what you all come up with. And uh, thanks again, Chris. You're welcome. All right, folks, we are going to be taking another short break. This is going to be a video uh, from you all. So we're taking a short break. This is for you. It's focusing on you. Yes, you. I mean, you. OK, this video is folks in the community. I had a chance to sit down and with a few developers from the community and ask them what it is about VS Code that they enjoy the most. So let's take a moment really quick and hear what they had to say. I love that VS Code lets me customize my experiences based on how I want to use the software. I can use it to be an educator or a developer, all with one single installation. I would say extensibility. That's the, the game changer for VS Code. The ability to create extensions, to do whatever you need for whatever language, whatever preferences you have, extensibility is where it's at. My favorite feature of Visual Studio Code is the Dev Containers feature. It allows me to uh, easily set up a development environment on my computer using Docker and Visual Studio Code. Yeah, uh, my favorite part about VS Code is whenever I make a typo and I fix it, the text lights up and it brings a little bit of joy to my day. Hello everybody, my name is Diana Rodriguez and what I love the most about VS Code is a Python extension. Me being a Python developer, it's so much easier for me. Um, I just love it. I also love the theme, so kudos for that. <laughs> well, that was awesome and thanks everybody that participated in that and helping out. And it's glad to, I'm glad to hear all the different ways that VS Code brings happiness to folks and helps people out in their jobs. All right, so quick update on the poll results. Uh, the last poll we ran was, where do you prefer to work when you're remote? Uh, by a landslide, home office one. One that made me actually laugh out loud off camera was, you don't know me at all. <laughs> so well done, whoever that was. Uh, the next poll that's running right now you should see is, do you use the minimap in VS Code? And, and I know, non-answer again for me, but I kind of use it, sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. It's like a love-hate relationship, I don't know. Anyway, without further ado, let's uh, get ready for our next presentation. And hopefully I won't fumble on this. I wrote this introduction myself, but we'll see if I can get through without any hiccups, all right? Here we go. With one swift scissor sweep, this Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner will show you some full mount escapes from time-consuming context switches in your development workflow. Bring your hands together to help me welcome Peter McGee, Head of Developer Advocacy and Relations at Docker. Take it away, Peter. Hello, thanks for having me, Brian. I love that introduction. I'm going to keep that. Can I reuse that all over the place? Absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, thanks everybody. My name is Peter McKee. I'm on the developer relations team at Docker. And today I'm going to be talking about how to supercharge uh, your development using VS Code. And um, <clears throat> pardon me, VS Code and the uh, Docker extension. So one of the first things you need to do to get started is head over to uh, our hub, hub.docker.com, and create a free Docker ID. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, why you should do that. Next thing you should do is then head over to um, products, docker-desktop, and download the desktop. Come in here. You can choose whether for Mac or Windows. Then we'll install Docker locally on your machine, and you can interact with VS Code. Okay, so let's jump right into it. I don't have any slides today. We're going to spend all of our time inside of code here. So. So the first thing you want to do is you're going to come over here to the extensions. You can also uh, use a shortcut key or you can click on uh, the little icon over here and just search for Docker. And you should have the first result should come up um, and should be the extension that we want. So I already have it installed. 
was worried about internet connections and those type of things. But you'll have a little install button over here. Just click on that. That'll install the extension. Once it's installed, you'll have this little whale icon or little Moby icon. So if you click on that, we have a bunch of little panels to your left. And your panels not, might, might not be in the same order that mine are, but I like to organize mine this way because I usually build images first and then I run those images in containers and then they use volumes and networks. So right now you can see I have a couple of images. I have a Mongo image and an Nginx. I don't have any containers running, no volumes right now. I do have bridge network, uh, I do have networks, and these are the networks that uh, Docker sets up for you. I, again, I'm not gonna dive too deep into those, but you can check out our docs if you wanna learn a little more about networking. Um, and then you have context. I won't, again, I won't dive too deep into this, but a context is basically allows you to set up a context for uh, a cloud, a public cloud. So either AWS or Azure, you can set up a context that points there, and then you can run your same Docker CLI commands that you know and love and they'll be run up in the cloud for you. If you wanna learn more about that, check out our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, got a bunch of stuff out on there, really cool stuff. Next one is the, re the registry. So I'm gonna connect to a registry and I'm gonna connect in the hub. So I clicked on connect registry and this opens up the drop down here. I'm gonna choose hub, I'm gonna put in my Docker ID. Oh, oh. gotta hit the right keys here. Hardest part about doing demos is typing in front of people. And then put in your uh, password. Okay, now we're connected in the hub. So you can see Docker Hub here. You can expand hub. You can see our uh, repositories that you're a member of. You can ex uh, expand the repositories, see the images that you have. And then if you expand your images, you can see all the tags. So I'm gonna grab the latest here. And if you right click, easy way to pull that image, just right click choose pull, that'll pull down your image from hub. You can see right here what command is being run by the extension, a Docker pull. So that'll pull down images from hub. Once it's done, it'll show up here at the top. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of the, of the plugin right now. So let's take a look at a sample application. So I have a really simple uh, Node.js application. I'm using a little framework that I wrote that uh, I just use for demos. It simplifies the code a little bit. But we basically have two REST endpoints here. And um, we're going to be using this one mostly. Don't worry too much about the code. It's just sample code. All right. So we have an application. We have our code. We have our extension installed. So it could be great. I could just run the application right now and start debugging. But I want to run everything in containers. right? I want to use my uh, containers to debug and develop, develop in and then share those out to the world. So. I need a Docker file. To build an image, we need a Docker file. A couple of ways you can do that. But with the extension, if I open up the command palette and I type in Docker file, add Docker file uh, to your workspace, we're gonna click on that. Now, now it's asking me, what's my application platform? So I'm running Node.js, so I'll click on that. Now it's looking for the package.json. And the extension uses the package.json to uh, fill out different parameters and to infer how to run different commands. And I'm going to show a little bit of that in a second. So let me choose the package JSON. It's not underneath my node modules. And then our application actually runs on 8080. So let me add that in there. We're not going to add a compose file at this time. So go ahead and do that. And voila, I got a fantastic Docker file here. Let me add a little bit of white space. And okay, there we go. So now we got our Docker file. Let me save that. I'm not going to run through the Docker file for the sake of time. But a key things I wanna show is it just sets up your node environment variables, includes your includes and installs your packages. And then right here on line 10, I wanna point this out. So we're copying, what the dots mean is I'm gonna copy everything in the context, my Docker context that I've sent to the build command. I wanna copy everything there and I'm gonna put it inside the image and it's gonna put inside the working directory because I set a working directory. So what if we have files that are in our working in our context, in our project that we don't want included in our file, in our image. So usually what we do is we create a Docker ignore, a dot Docker ignore. And of course the extension has set this up for me, put this into my project, has some awesome defaults. You'll see here, we're not including node modules, those type of things. Uh, little quick uh, tip, if your images uh, that you're producing when you're building are large, Make sure you have a Docker ignore file. Uh, I see that a lot. Sometimes it's a you know new projects and those type of things. You forget to create a Docker ignore file. You're putting 
document, uh, whole documentation project uh, folder into your image and it just expands your image. So check that first. So the extension sets that up. Awesome. Okay, so we installed the, inst the extension and now we have a Docker file produced for us. Let's go ahead and build an image. So a couple ways you can do that. I like to just right click right on my Docker file, choose build image. So that's gonna run, that's gonna run a build. Sometimes it doesn't like to run when I do it demoing. There we go. Okay, so it's built my image. I'm gonna scroll up here, sorry for the fast scrolling. But you can see the extension runs the exact same commands that you would be running in the terminal. And others uh, have made the point that context switching really kills your productivity, right? So normally I would be alt tabbing or I'd be coming down here somewhere, I'd be clicking on the terminal, I'd be running a Docker command there, then coming back into VS Code, coding a little bit, going back to my terminal, those type of things, right? But if you're staying in VS Code and using the extension, it reduces the amount of context switching you need to do. So also here to note is we have some of these, uh, all these flags are getting passed into the build, right? So where do all those come from? So another really cool thing that the extension does for us is it includes this, uh, this task.json file. And so what it did is it created three tasks, one for a build and then two for running our images, one for release and one for debug. And right here you can see, uh, you, can, you can configure the way uh, things are built and the way things are run. So let's look, take a look at our images real quick. So let me make this, see if I can get some more room here. Oh well, okay, there we go. There's our zap name, the image that was just built. And we have the latest, right? So where did this Z, Z, zap p name come from? Well, Docker looks at knows that you have a node application because we set that up when we were we were created our Docker file. So what that does is looks in the pa package.json, looks for your name in there. If you don't have a name in your package.json, it'll bump up into the directory and use the directory name. But I don't like that. This is some name that I just have from a from a previous demo. Um, so I want what I want to do is change that. So I'm going to come into my tasks. And I'm going to add another configuration in here. I'm going to call it tag and give a colon. And I'm going to call it VS Code, Code Docker. Okay, I'm going to save that. I'm going to come back. I'm going to run, build my image from now over on the Explorer side. And again, just right click, choose Build Image. And that builds my image. So let's go ahead and take a look now at our images. Let's close some of these down so we can um, have a better look. Okay, cool. So now I have VS Code, VS Code Docker, that image, and I have my zap name. We don't need this one anymore. So a lot of things, again, you don't have to, I don't have to switch it over to my terminal. I can stay right here, just right click, and say remove. Yep, remove that image. Okay, and now it's gone. So we got, we've built our image. We've, um, we changed what tag we want. Now let's go ahead and run, run our project inside of a container, right? And so now all we have to do is let's come over to the deba debug. Oh, real quick, let me show you. So we have this uh, launch.json. The extension also set this up for us. And you can see right here, this pre-launch task is gonna run this docker-run colon debug task. And that is gonna look right here in the debug. And what's pretty cool, it has this depends on. So it's gonna depend on this Docker build, which is our build at the beginning, and then it's gonna run our project. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna click on the run. It started up. And I know that that scrolled by really fast there. So uh, we'll come up to the top and we can see that we built. And then if I scroll to the bottom, again, sorry for the fast scrolling, you can see that I've run, uh, ran my image. And now we're up and running. We have our image running. We're good to go. You can see that we've uh, that the extension has pulled in these environment variables out of our task down here. You can see we set environment variables, those were pulled in. And also a really cool thing is we're exposing port 9229, which is the default debug port. And then it runs node using the dash dash inspect. That's setting up our debugger. Okay, so now let's come over to the extension, expand my containers, give it a refresh. And now we can see that our container is running. Pretty simple. We can right click on that, we can view logs. Make this bigger for folks. So you can see all the logs that are running out of your container that are being produced from your container. You can even attach into uh, a shell inside of your inside of your container, excuse me. And we could do run regular commands. We can cat out uh, files. 
we can take a look at what's going on, right? So let's go ahead and stop that. I think one last thing I want to do. So let me go ahead and stop that. Move this down here. So this is all great, running awesome. Let's open up our source file and let's see if we can, we got a debug uh, point set. Let's see if we can um, run our image inside of our con container, contact, uh, sorry, connect with Visual Studio Code into the container and see our, bro our breakpoint break. Okay, awesome. Let's go up here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with debugging. You can also push your F5. You could come over into the bug, debug tab and you can start it from here. Okay, so we're up and running. Uh, the debugger's attached. I have my breakpoint set. So I'll come back over to my browser and let's hit that code endpoint. And there we go. It hit our breakpoint. Now we're right in, we're from the container, we're debugging into the container, back in the Visual Studio Code. We have our breakpoint and we're able to inspect just like you normally would. You can see all kinds of interesting things running. You can debug your code. Um, yep, so nice seamlessly uh, connect right into your container. Let's re make sure, and now you can see it running. You can also look, you can also expand your file systems. A lot of times when you're building your images and your containers are running, uh, you'll get file not found, those type of things. You easy way to see what's been added into your uh, container is by looking right here in the containers uh, panel. Okay, awesome. So let's go ahead and stop this. Give that a second to stop. One last thing I want to show is another, and I'm, I could probably do it while it's stopping, is typing all those commands out and getting things uh, on the command line is very uh, is time consuming. You can't remember all those things, right? So compose files are really awesome to uh, configure your containers and run them locally and orchestrate them locally. So you can have your, uh, like we have right here, our REST uh, API. And let's say we wanted to connect that in the database, we can add that in a compose file. So let's build a compose real quick. So we'll just do uh, Docker, compose, and add a compose file to your workspace. Yes. And Node.js, some of the same questions. Package JSON. We're running on port 8080. And it's going to uh, run a bit. Let's come over here. Now we can see it's created two files for us. We have a Docker compose. This is everything that we'd be typing out on the command line. Same thing, the extension is running. It's all nicely packaged up in your compose file. You can add in uh, any services you need, networks, volumes, those type of things. Um, and then also we have one for debugging, right? And we can see here that it's gonna run the command. It's gonna overwrite the command that I have in my uh, Docker file, and it's gonna run this uh, dash dash inspect. So we can put it into debug mode and we can debug. Awesome, thank you so much. There's a ton more you can do with the extension. I wish uh, I have more time. Maybe I'll do a video on, on all the other features, but yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me and listen to me uh, talk. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. So some questions for you. we got a few minutes to do some Q&A. All right. Um, for folks that are new to Docker and containers and images, some of these terms might not be familiar. So if you could describe what's the difference between an image and a container? Yeah, yeah. I, I know um, this is a question I get asked a lot, right? It can be confusing. There, there's conf some confusion out there around uh, VMs and containers. So the way I like to explain it is a, a virtual machine virtual virtualizes your hardware, right? So you have the hardware, you have a bunch of CPUs and a bunch of memory. You put in a, um, a VM layer and that allows operating systems to be installed, multiple different oper operating systems be installed and it virtualizes the hardware. Containers virtualize the OS. Mm -hmm. So you have one OS installed and you have multiple containers running. It's just a simple, normal, operating system process that's been wrapped and um, isolated from the rest of the processes. So that process runs and thinks it has access to everything it can see. So that's the main differences between the two. And that's why you can't run uh, a Windows EXE on a Linux um, operating system, right? On As a container and vice versa. You have, it shares the underlying operating system. And then real quick, the difference between an image and a container is I, I like to put it into object oriented terms. So in object oriented, we have classes and objects. So class is kind of the template that produce multiple objects. Same thing with an image in a container. Your image is your template, kind of the cookie cutter that, that, that uh, stamps out containers. So an image is run inside of a container and you can run that image in multiple containers. So hopefully that helps.
Yeah, absolutely. That's it's, it's I like the way you put that with the classes and, and all that. Um and cookies. You gotta you gotta talk about cookies. Yes, of course. I mean you had me at cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peter. That was super helpful and insightful. Uh and thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, folks, quick update on the poll results. Mini map. Um, it's a little bit closer. Uh some 65% of you say you use it and love it, and 35% say turn that off. So there you go. Next poll that should be going right around now is the integrated terminal or using, do you use an integrated terminal or an external terminal? Let us know. and we'll, we'll update you on the results of that shortly. But without further ado, let's get into our next set section. No, session. Come on, Brian, you're professional. The next session, once a competitive squash player, now program manager at Microsoft, Claudia Reggio is up next to help you avoid any foot faults when using notebooks in VS Code. Drop those clap emojis in the chat to help me welcome Claudia, presenting Notebooks in VS Code are getting revamped. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining me to learn about Notebooks in VS Code. I had a really cool demo planned out for you guys, but as some of you know, uh, sometimes things break and my machine decided not to cooperate with me. So oh, I just a little really quick yesterday uh, and I was able to put something together. So we're actually gonna go through um, uh, as a slideshow but I'll still be presenting everything that I wanted to present. So we're not missing any information, just won't be live, unfortunately. I'm hoping what you guys will do is actually go home and download VS Code Insiders so you can see these live in action once you're done learning them from me. All right, so first things first, uh, I'm actually going over the VS Code Insiders experience today. Most of the features that you're going to see are not available in the stable version of VS Code, although some of them are. And to get started, what you're going to need is the Python extension as well as some other extensions, but they'll be appended at the end of this demo. So don't worry if you miss them as I'm speaking. While our Jupyter extension has support for many other languages such as Julia or R, uh, I'm gonna be focusing on the Python notebooks experience today. All right, let's get started. So for those of you who are not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, what is a Jupyter Notebook? A uh, Jupyter Notebook is an interactive programming and computational document and it allows users to mix executable code, equations, visualizations, and narrative text. And the Jupyter Notebooks consists of these cells, and it is the flexible ability to run these cells a couple of times over after tweaking them, or even out of order, that um, is so conducive to the playground nature of data science, which is what led it to become the de facto tool for data science. For those of you who are familiar with our current implementation in VS Code Stable, you might be asking, why are we revamping? So we are moving from a WebView implementation to a natively supported notebook file type um, implementation. What that means is you will now benefit from the integration of all other VS Code extensions in the VS Code marketplace that you know and love, such as the Vim key bindings or bracket colorizer. Those are two very popular ones. You'll also benefit from improved notebook load times as well as a new modern design. How can you try one out in VS Code Insiders? So obviously first go online and download VS Code Insiders. Then you'll want to open the command palette uh, after downloading the extensions appended at the end. You can do that by holding down Control Shift P or Command Shift P if you're on a Mac. And what that's going to do is that's going to pull up this, uh, this drop down list here. You'll type in the keyword notebook and you'll want to pick the first option that comes up. It's gonna be create new blank Jupyter notebook. So then what happens when you select that command? What is that gonna look like? All right, for stable users, this looks very different. So let's go through what's, what's new. We have our notebook toolbar, obviously in the top right, uh, consistent with all our other VS Code notebook toolbars. Here in the bottom right of the cell, we actually have the language picker. This is going to indicate what language you're working with. Pretty intuitive name, I think. Down here in the global status bar, if you click on, on this uh, action down here, it's going to bring a drop-down option of your kernels or your preferred Python environment. So if you want to switch your Python environment, this is where you'll want to click. Next, sometimes if you're working with a notebook that is, um, it needs more computational power, it might take a couple hours on your local machine and you want to actually connect to a remote server that might have something like a GPU, this is where you'll want to click. Here, when you click in this area, you'll get another dropdown. You'll get three options. And the third option is where you can actually input the URI to the remote Jupyter server that you are trying to connect to. Here we have our cell toolbar. 
and this is completely customizable. So mine is on the left, but by default, you'll see it on the right. And you can actually also hide this toolbar if you're somebody who's very keyboard heavy and you just aren't interested in seeing the icon surface to you. Obviously here, we have the ability to add our code and mark down cells. Last but not least, we have our run icon. Now you can click the run icon to execute the cell, or you can also use one of our many uh, supported Jupyter shortcuts to run, such as shift enter. All right, first things first, this is a feature that is coming from stable. We're not letting go of variable explorer. Var variable explorer is coming with. So while you're working in your notebook, uh, it gets very, very easy to lose track of the state of your variables as well as the values. So as you're you know, tweaking variables, tweaking data frames, rerunning things, it gets very easy to lose track of where you're at. To make print statements to try and realize where you're at, we have the variable explorer. You can access the variable explorer through the notebook toolbar by clicking on this grid-like icon. And what that's going to do is this is going to pop up on the bottom of your canvas. As you can see, we have the name, we have a type, we have the size, and we have a preview of the value in this variable. Over to the left here of uh, one of our variables, we have access to the data viewer. So when you click this icon to the left, that's actually going to open up the data viewer. And the data viewer is an Excel-like um, view of your data. It's a lot easier for us to process things this way. And the most powerful part of the data viewer is the ability to filter rows. So if you click this button in the top left, you're going to get this top panel right up here. And what you can do is you can put in uh, logical statements here to filter for things quickly. So while you're trying to understand the quality of your data, for example, you could write a bunch of code to first identify the issues, and then you could write a bunch more code to resolve those issues. The data viewer is gonna help you identify the issues much quicker. For example, if I write less than zero in this age area right here, and none of the rows pop up, that means my ages are all acceptable values in terms of data quality. All right, next one up. I would do a drum roll for this one, but it's not gonna be good enough. Next up, table of contents. I'm really, really excited to announce that this is now available in VS Code Insiders. This has been the number one requested feature uh, from the community. I'm really, really happy to finally have it. In order to access the table of contents, you'll wanna make sure first you're in the File Explorer tab. And then you'll want to come to the bottom and open up outline. So sometimes that's sneakily hiding down there. Don't lose it. And when you click on outline, what you see is the output on the right. So as you can see here, we have the entire skeleton of the notebook. We can see the hierarchical relationship between our markdown cells and our code cells. And like many other table of contents, you can just click to navigate where you'd like to go in the notebook. And if you'd like to navigate just in markdown, you can go ahead and just collapse those code cells. All right, next one, highly, highly sought after feature as well as live share. So right now, live share is supporting co-editing and bi-directional execution. Thankfully, I was able to record this yesterday before my machine turned on me, so you can see this working. You can see that I have a coworker in one of my cells, and he's actually going to be adding some text and editing, and then he runs the cell, and I'm able to proceed and run the next one. So obviously, there's a lot more to come with live share. But right now, we were way too excited to, to leave out that it was currently um, functioning and had some functionality here. So go ahead and try it. This is available today. It launched yesterday in the, in the VS Code uh, Insiders. Next up, we have diffing. So diffing notebooks has always been a little bit tricky. There hasn't been an optimal solution quite yet. So VS Code is building a custom rich text editor diff. What that means is we have a custom ability to diff notebooks. And as you can see here in this example, I can see the difference in the code that leads to a different output. And you can see we have the outputs are rendered within the diff, which makes it really, really easy to see when one of our outputs has changed. We also have the ability to check metadata. And this right here, to open up the metadata, all you have to do is click on the Chevron in case that is something that is interesting to you. All right, another one, Gather. So Gather is actually a complementary extension. So this is one of those additional ones that you would have to get in the um, VS Code Marketplace, just like LiveShare. And what ends up happening is many times when you reach the end of your notebook and you've tried a couple approaches, but you decide, okay, 
I want to move forward with this approach. Data cleaning can, or cleaning your notebook, excuse me, can be very tricky and can be laborious and, and error prone as you try and copy and paste cells into a new notebook or you try and delete cells from your current notebook. And the last thing you wanna do is delete cells and break your notebook flow when you've reached the final portion. So what Gather is, is Gather is a tool that assists with data cleaning and Gather will take only the relevant lines of code necessary to produce cell output. So as you can see here in my left example, I've got four cells. I have this third one here. This is some random code. It does not contribute to this cell down here in any way. So if I go ahead and click gather right here on the icon that's surfaced, what's going to be generated is this output in a new notebook. And by setting, you can choose if you'd like it to uh, export to a new notebook or actually a Python script. So as you can see here, a quick, com a quick comparison, we see that our inputs are reduced any input that any import that we ran code that was here before is not in our output and as you can see only the relevant lines of code that were necessary to create this cell are here so gather is meant to speed up your notebook cleaning process at the end hopefully much faster than how you're doing it now all right and once you've reached a final stage of your notebook uh, many times what people will do is they will either need to, um, you know, transfer it to their production counterparts uh, or they will present it. So we have a quick way for you to do both those things. We have the export uh, option, which is located in the notebook toolbar in the top right again. And that will bring down a drop down where you can again export to Python script for production. You can export to HTML. That's especially convenient if you have IPy widgets, for example, in your notebook, and you'd like to actually be able to still scroll through those. Or if you want something static for presentation purposes, PDF is available as well. Here I have a list of the extensions you're going to need again. So it's the Python extension. It comes with the Jupyter extension, Live Share, and Gather. That's it for me for notebooks. I hope you guys are excited about live share support. I hope you're excited about diffing. I hope you are uh, excited about gather. And if there's, uh, you know, go home, try it out, give me feedback. My contact info is up here on the board. So if you want to give me feedback or have any feature requests, please get in touch. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claudia. So we're jumping into the Q&A now. And a quick reminder to folks over that might be watching this on other platforms, if you head on over to aka.ms slash learn TV, there's a chat available there where you can get your questions heard and answered. And we'll bring them onto the stream and answer them for you. So Claudia, right off the bat, I, I know you showed a lot of amazing features that are part of the revamped notebooks functionality, but you also had limited time for this presentation and a little bit, you know, things to other things to work with in here. What are some of the features that maybe you didn't get a chance to demo, but you'd like to let the viewers know about when it comes with to the revamping of notebooks? Yeah, so we're also looking forward to support for multi-select. Uh, that opens doors for a lot of quicker actions within notebooks. Uh, we're also looking forward to notebook templates. That's a, that's a special one near and dear to my heart. And um, let's see, what's another one? Yeah, I think just more applications of the gather technology. We have uh, we have a lot of ideas of ways that 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 aggregation of of the code stream can be used and applied to to make life simpler for data scientists. Nice. Um, I I got to share too. I've been kind of learning slowly, learning Python and getting used to it. And uh, when I first discovered just notebooks in general, I was like blown away by the ability to be able to just write some scripts up and test it out separately outside of an application. So just amazing work you all are doing. There was a question that had popped up um, and it was about maybe, well, it went away. So I'm going to let that go. In any case, uh, thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, it was very useful and helpful information. I'm excited to see what's in store for Notebooks moving on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, folks, a uh, quick reminder on the poll results. The integrated terminal one, I'm not sure what's going on, what the results are of that, but we'll get back to you. Um, but the new poll that should be rolling up soon is, do you use a split editor? Do you you know, have one file opener with some, maybe some tabs, and then you split it open to another side within Visual Studio Code, and you have some other things where you can look side by side? I find certain scenarios, I might use that. In some scenarios, I, I need the full screen real estate and just have the one editor. But what, what's, what do you do? What do you do, chat? What do you do, community, fellow developers, programmers, engineers out there? 
let us know in the poll. All right. So, and again, I want to remind folks that if you are watching on another platform right now, maybe YouTube, you can go ahead and head on over to aka.ms slash learn TV if you have any questions that you'd like to be answered. They're either being answered by our moderators in the chat room already, or we'll bring them on stream and ask the presenters for you. Now, last but certainly not least, our next presenter is an avid runner who completed her first half marathon. The speaker is excited to help you get up and running fast with some fire VS Code tricks, all without breaking a sweat, too. Let's get a round of applause for Sana Ajani, Program Manager at Microsoft, presenting VS Code Tips and Tricks. Over to you, Sana. All right. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for that. Uh, welcome to VS Code Day, and thanks for making it to the last session. Um, my name is Sana, and I'm a Program Manager on the team. I'm coming to you from the East Coast, so I hope wherever you're located, you and your loved ones are safe. Um, so today I'm going to share some fire VS Code tips and tricks. Some of the customization features that we've brought on in the last six months or so. Um, uh, some of the things that I think can really make and improve the quality of life in the editor for you and make it a lot better. So let me just share my screen. Uh, you can see my screen over here. I have a very basic Node.js Express app and let's get right into it. So I'm going to open up my settings. So command comma opens up my settings. The first thing I want to show you is kind of a warm up one. I just recently learned about this and I thought it really um, helped improve what I was doing. So it's this one. So files.default language. So right now, if I were to open a new file in my editor, it is a plain text file by default. So I don't get any of the colorization and syntax highlighting I might expect. So I can change that. And right now I set it to be a markdown file because often when I'm creating new files in VS Code. I'm just kind of jotting down a couple of notes. I just want to do it in Markdown. So now if I open a new file, it's in Markdown and I can start taking notes as I want to. So that's a really cool setting I like, really improved my workflow. In fact, another thing you can set this to is actually active editor language. So this means that wherever editor I open the new file from, the new file will take on the same language as that. So if I open a new file from a JavaScript file right now, the new file I do is actually in JavaScript. So that's really cool. The next setting I want to show you is um, a setting to improve the suggestions that the editor gives you while you're coding. So this is a new setting that came in uh, recently, editor.suggest.showStatusBar and editor.suggest.insertMode. So let me show you what this does. I go to my JavaScript file um, and I type app. So the new setting that we just added adds this status bar underneath the suggestions I see. So right now um, I can go in and you know press enter to insert the, uh, the, the method that it just provided to me. I can also go back here and re-trigger my suggestions. And I can also see if I want to replace the method instead of inserting it. So this will replace it. That was really neat. All right. The status bar also tells me that I can toggle the details of the methods that, of the suggestions. So if I press control space, I can also see details of this, right? So that's really cool. I can toggle the details if I want to, because sometimes we know that if you provide too many suggestions, it covers your code. Um, so you can toggle the details like that as well. To make it even better, you can actually change the size of the suggest widget. So if you want to take up more, if you want to make it horizontally uh, short, vertically short, if you just want to see one suggestion at a time, you can do that. You can also do that for the details as well. So this way you can kind of see and toggle the information that you want provided to you. And VS Code will remember the sizes of the widgets that you just did over here. All right, cool. That's a really nice quality of life feature, I like to call it. The next thing we want to I want to show you is actually a really hot feature that was highly highly requested for a couple of years in the editor, and that is pin tabs. So wait for it. Are you ready? Right click, pin, boom. I I can I can pin the tabs in my uh, editor as I want. So I can pin multiple tabs if I want to, and if I have multiple um, files open and I close all of them, the pin tabs are persistent, so they won't close until you unpin them. So that's really cool. You know, they're always at the front of the rest of your um, tabs you have open. So if I want to go and kind of play around with more customizations with the pin tabs, I can change this setting, tab sizing. So I have it set to normal, but the other options for this are compact and shrink. So compact will just show you 
the file type icon of the tab and not the full name. And then shrink will show you the first couple of um, letters of the file name. So if you want it like that, I prefer to have this to be set to normal. And then the other thing that was highly, highly requested uh, that's a really cool feature in setting is the ability to wrap your tabs. So if I have a couple of tabs open, uh, before I would have to, if this was disabled, I would have to um, kind of scroll through all of them. So if I open up a bunch of files, you can see that I have to scroll through all my editors I have open. But now with this setting, they just wrap onto the second row and that's awesome. And I can see all the tabs I have open. So I really like this. Um, it makes it easier for me at least to kind of know what I have open and what I don't and pin the tabs I want to you know, keep. Another way to kind of distinguish between the pin tabs you have open and the unpinned tabs you have open is to go into your color customizations for your theme. So you can see here that I'm rocking the Synthwave 84 theme at the moment. And um, I can actually customize this theme a little bit further. So I have a couple of settings for tabs I have set. Um, so if I, un if I uncomment this, you can now see I have a slight yellow line kind of distinguishing the last of my pin tabs and the remainder of my tabs. So I prefer to have this because it just lets me visually see what I have pinned and what I don't have pinned. So I really, really like this setting as well. Speaking of customizations, another thing that we constantly heard from developers is that they want to kind of customize VS Code in the way it looks. Um, and so VS Code, I think the best thing about it is that you can really change it to be your preferences. So my VS Code and your VS Code could look very different and that's totally okay. So what I wanna do is show you the flexible layout option that we added to the editor. So if there are views in the sidebar that you prefer to maybe have in the panel at the bottom here, you can do that and vice versa. So for instance, if I wanted to um, take the debug console, I grab it by its header and I can kind of place it in the sidebar if I want to. I can place it in its own view or I can place it in an existing view. So I can put it in the debug view over here and voila, that was awesome, super easy. If I wanted to take the search and move it from the sidebar and put it in the panel because I want like a wider, um, ooh, if I want a wider kind of way to look at my output, I can do that here and this is now my editor. So this is super neat. It really lets you play around with if you wanna see things on the left, on the right, top, bottom, whatever your preferred uh, method of kind of viewing all your parts of your code is. And if you want, if you kind of mess around with the drag and drop a little bit too much, you can reset everything by using the command reset view locations. All right, cool. So now that we've customized our editor a lot to our liking, um, what happens if I were to set up a new machine with VS Code, right? I don't wanna go through the hassle of kind of taking all my settings, all my key bindings, all my, uh, you know, the UI state that I customized just now, and having to reset that up on a new machine. If I had a work machine and I was setting up a new personal machine, I wanna make sure my environment is, is relatively the same. So before you spend an afternoon or a couple hours doing that, we I wanna show you something called setting sync that we recently added as well. So I'm gonna emulate the, the two kind of device workflow by using insiders, which I have right now, and stable. So the stable is like my new kind of machine I have. So you can see here that I am actually logged into setting sync. So setting sync is what preserves your settings and your extensions across different machines. So you can see what I'm actually syncing. I'm setting my set settings, my keyboard shortcuts, uh, my snippets, extension, UI state, syncing all of it, great. So I'm going to go into here and make sure that setting sync is turned on. So this is my new kind of instance of VS Code I'm setting up. So let's turn this on and it's gonna ask me what I want to sync across my devices, all of them as well. Sign in with my GitHub account and it gives me an option to merge or replace my settings. So I want to actually replace these local settings with the settings I've synced in the cloud with my insider settings. So I'm gonna replace the local ones from the ones that have synced and there you go. Um, my settings now look like the settings I had in my insiders, right? So I can open up, my settings are all here, all of my extensions are here. So as soon as I make a change over here, so for instance, if I wanted to hide the Azure and the Remote Explorer things over here, if I do that, it syncs up as well over here and it happens pretty instantaneously. So this was a, it literally took less than a minute to set up my new machine. I don't have to worry about the hassle of, you know, making sure I saved everything, preserved everything. 
VS Code will just take care of that for me. And now that I've signed into GitHub, uh, sorry, to VS Code with my GitHub account, it also unlocks a couple more um, GitHub related features that make it really easy to improve the quality of your life as a developer. So for instance, this is my sample express app, but I haven't backed it up yet. It's just locally on my machine. So if I go over to the source control view over here, I can get an option to initialize this as a GitHub Git repository or publish this directly to GitHub. So I'm gonna press on this. Um, so this gives me an option to publish directly to my GitHub because I've already signed in. Um, I can make it a private or public repository. So I'll make this a private one. I can choose what files I want to push. Um, let's just choose all of them. And it will, in a couple of seconds, upload everything to GitHub, make sure it's being tracked in VS Code with source control, and I can go directly to it. So I show you what that just opened up over here and did my first commit for me. That was super easy, literally a push of a button to kind of make sure I've backed everything up in VS Code uh, with source control. So earlier, if I had to go do this, I would go to GitHub, create an empty repository, um, have an, a single file in there, bring it down and then drop my local files into that. That's kind of a roundabout way of doing this. So this makes it a lot easier to just directly do it from VS Code. One more thing I wanna show you is if I start with a new window, I can do something similar as well. So now I have an empty window with no folder open, but I wanna actually clone a repository from GitHub. So here I get an option in the Explorer to clone the repository. So doing this, clone from GitHub, I can search for everything on GitHub. Um, so I can either put in a link or because I've signed in, I get this sweet option. So I can search for anything I want to. If I wanted to do create React app, to search for it from here. Um, but what I want to do is actually clone this cat said node project. Um, and within a couple seconds, it's cloned. So I don't have to worry about choosing if I want to clone over HTTPS or SSH. This kind of just does it for me. You don't have to run a git fetch. Um, so if I check my remotes, it set that up for me as well. Very easy. Um, so I just have to worry about starting my code and not worrying about getting it into the editor. So we made it a lot easier to kind of get started over here with those tips. So I hope that helped. Um, Brian, back to you. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, I, I do love tips and tricks. You know I'm a big fan of that, right, Sana? I love tips and tricks. I, yeah. These these are so much fun to kind of go through the release notes each each release and see what's new. Yeah. Uh, so so questions for you right off the bat. Um, lots of lots of this really is helpful in terms of like improving your development workflow that that developer loop so to speak that some folks have termed. Um, and I, I greatly enjoy micro optimizations even the slightest bit because of how repetitive we might be doing these things within our editor. So. In terms of extensions, though, sometimes they help add into, into the product productivity that we have. What would be your favorite extension around that kind of thing as a tip for folks to check out? Ooh, my favorite extension definitely has to be LiveShare. Um, I actually was recently showing a friend uh, how to use LiveShare, and I just realized like how amazing it is to be able to connect with people in the same editor. Um, it's really providing a seamless experience as we're all working remotely. I think it's increased productivity for a lot of folks and teams, um, even students in, cla in classrooms uh, learning to code. Um, I think LiveShare has made a lot of that a lot easier. So if you're not using it, you're missing out on an awesome experience in VS Code. LiveShare is fantastic. All right, and then in terms of your tips, you shared a lot of tips today, but is there one, just one major tip that's essential that you wanna share with everybody that can help them benefit? Yeah, let me share my screen. Um, cool. So uh, there's a lot of really great feed, uh, kind of hot tips. Um, I think if you haven't done a couple, like autosave, make sure you've uh, kind of said that to be uh, on. Um, I really liked this file default language when I showed earlier because it made it a lot easier to just kind of not have to worry about saving my file and just working in the current context I'm in. Um, if I had to pick a really cool tip, I did say these were fire tips. There was a really cool extension I found called Power Mode, and it actually adds flames while you code. So I thought that was really neat. So as I'm coding, you can see some awesome kind oh, of fun that. customizations. That is fire. Well done. Well done. That's awesome. So there you go, folks. Check out the Power Mode extension for VS Code if you want to have 
fire <laughs> as you're typing. All right, one last thing that I think folks might be thinking, and I'm hoping you might be able to give us some insight here. Is there any hint as to what might be coming with VS Code in the future this year? Yeah, I think a couple of people earlier might have teased at it, but um, uh, I think you know we saw a lot of things about notebooks. Uh, we saw a lot of things about remote development. Um, code spaces was mentioned. All of this is kind of on the roadmap to really um, kind of improve uh, the different kinds of editing experiences you can have. So we've worked on the, the current out of box experience, but also involving other editors. So notebook editors, um, really useful for data science and education. Um, we have the new testing infrastructure, I think Eric teased at. Um, and there's a lot more also coming with like improving the kind of the getting started experience um, in VS Code. So um, the welcome page, maybe look out for a new one coming soon. Awesome, that's that's fantastic to hear and uh, very exciting stuff. It's it's great to see the how, how much VS Code has come and uh, and just anticipating what's what's what else is out there for it. So thank you so much, Sana. I'm definitely going to be incorporating some of those tips into my dev development workflow. Cool. Thank you, Brian. All right, folks. That brings us to the end. But don't go anywhere just yet. Just a few little housekeeping closing things that we got for you, and then we'll call it a day. Okay. So one, number one, do not forget these sessions are recorded. And they'll be available on the VS Code YouTube account. So if you want to go check that out, head on over to aka.ms slash VS Code YT YouTube. Okay, so that's one. So if you missed one, maybe you couldn't listen into all of it. We got you covered. Don't worry. It's also going to be replaying again later this evening right here on Learn TV again, aka.ms slash Learn TV. And that way you can watch it and uh, catch up on the ones that you may have missed or want to reference again. Also, you are not going to go away empty handed empty-handed, we have digital swag for you. So as a, another reminder for you, there are wallpapers. If you go to code.visualstudio.com slash events, you can snag some of those awesome VS Code wallpapers. Another thing that's available out there, not quite yet, but you may have noticed it. If you're looking closely, some of the presenters are wearing a VS Code t-shirt. Those will be available to you. So make sure you go and follow the VS Code Twitter account, twitter.com slash code. How they got that handle? It's amazing that they got that handle. That's awesome. So go follow that account, check it out, and, and keep an eye out for when they'll post a link to where you can go ahead and get t-shirts if you'd like. Now, uh, we want to potentially keep doing these types of things, having VS Code Day. This is our first one, and we'd love to hear your feedback on how things w went, what we can improve upon, what things we can maybe not do. And so we have a survey that's available for you. So this is your reminder. Check out that, that survey. We want to hear your input. It's your chance to, you know, determine what we should do in the future with this type of event. So head on over to aka.ms slash VSCD, VS Code Day, basically, hyphen or dash survey. The, the links to that will be in the Learn TV chat if you need the direct one. And then it'll also be tweeted out on the VS Code Twitter account if you'd like to catch that. Um, so with that, also for future events, so one thing that we have been doing, the VS Code team has been doing, is they've been doing, they mentioned how, like Eric was talking about in the beginning, they release on a monthly cadence, which is a lot of releases. And uh, what they're going to be doing or have been doing in the past and trying out is doing live release events. So you'll be able to tune in, get in contact with the folks that are working directly on VS Code, hear from them some of the new features that are coming out, out in that, plus potentially other things that might be coming aboard with that. So if you want to keep in tune with what's going on there and catch one of those when they happen at the end of a release, you can go to code.visualstudio.com slash live streams. And that will have all the information on upcoming events that we might be holding. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for being here. I hope this brought you some value, some cool things that you learned about VS Code. We really appreciate you being here. We hope you stay safe, stay healthy. I'm Brian Clark, and we're out of here. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Bye.